yeah uh for now i'll just put um i'll just put your um your name up there and what are your pronouns by the way just to be sure she her or they them okay. okay and what what channel do you want me to have up there so that people can find you or do you want like a oh. discord link what do you want um honestly like yeah my stream would be great, which is twitch.tv slash aristocracy TV. Aristocracy spelt like with an Aris. Aristocracy TV, you said? Yeah. Excellent. All right. We got that up on the screen then. People will be able to find you. We're going to have a little guest tag for you as well. So oh, people thank will be you. able to find you from thank there. Thank you. That's of course. so awesome. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, sick. Uh, let me just... Um, let me just put this real quick. I'm going to probably just let's switch to open mic so that it's so we can now that we're talking. So give me just one second. Yeah, no problem. Everyone in my chat is talking about how great your lip ring is. Oh, uh, thank you. I it is. Uh, Well, actually, I love both. I love all my piercings, but it is. I love it. It's like I, one of the best decisions I ever made. Um, I, I think it looks like so good on, on my face. And so I'm very glad that I ignored people's advice to not get one. <laughs> Because I did. A lot of people told me not to do it. But I was like, Why nah, were people fuck telling that. you not to do it? Um, I don't know. A lot of people like feel weird about face pe facial piercings. Um, specifically like relatives and stuff were like, No, don't do mm -hmm. it. It's weird. It's you you have a piece of metal in your face. And I'm like, Yeah, I know, that's badass. So let me have it. And honestly, it was super, super um easy. I thought it was gonna be like, okay, it was painful, but it's such a short amount of pain that it's like over in it was the fastest of all of the piercings um besides like the first lobe piercing that i got which was like with a little gun um but this piercing it was like painful for like 10 seconds and then it was bruised for a couple days and then it was good um so yeah uh i feel like i it have was a, a harder time choice. with uh tattoos than piercings like i once went with my friend to go she was getting a tattoo yeah and i'd never passed out from a piercing but i passed out watching her get a tattoo oh no <laughs> i don't know how that happened <laughs> I have a pretty high pain tolerance in general. Um, the tattoo, I have a huge tattoo. Actually, you can probably see it. Your chat, there you go. Oh yeah. See, I like shirt. how tattoos work, like look. Yeah. Oh, that actually looks amazing. Yeah, I now, love the now this, with this shirt, y'all can see the whole thing for once. I, I always try to show it off, but it might, my, most of my tops have like, they cut it the wrong way. Um, but yeah, that tattoo took a long time, but for me, it was actually rather relaxing. Um, but then again, I have, I have a high pain tolerance, so yeah. Yeah, but um, uh, I can yeah, understand it. I, I can understand it. It can be a little grim to look at sometimes, the process at least. Yeah, it's just it's the process of doing it. Once it's done, I think they look beautiful, um, like after a few days. But yeah, yeah when it when it's happening, I don't know. There's just something about there's just something the about like the way it yeah. looks freaks me out. Yeah, I understand that completely. Yeah, I um, used to have this eyebrow piercing, um, but it would. And I thought it made me look kind of cool and alternative, but uh, it, it kept getting infected, so I had to get rid oh, of it. Oh <laughs> well, unfortunately, eyebrow tattoo or sorry, eyebrow piercings um, are one of the harder spots um, to keep track of or like to keep. Oh, helping. is that true? Yeah, they they have a really high rate of getting rejected because the skin is so uniquely thin there. Um, so there's a lot of chances for them to for your body to sort of reject it, and then also. Uh, which can cause it to get infected. Yeah, so that that makes sense. Um, there, yeah, exactly. Somebody in my chat's like, yeah, I used to have one got infected and rejected. Yep, that's that's how they go. Unfortunately, I just assumed kind of that I was that. disgusting, and you know, shame on me. But it's good to know it's a it's a bit bigger problem. Yeah, it is. Um, like infect, it, like getting infected on um on like any area where you get a piercing where there's like where the skin is really pink, uh, really thin. Likewise, um, subdermal piercings like the little the little tiny ones that people sometimes get on their dimples or yeah. like if you get them in your hips or whatever, those are very likely to get rejected. It just means you have to put like, like an extra, extra amount of work into making sure that you're disinfecting it every day that you keep it moisturized, stuff like that. Um, yeah. yeah. It's just how it goes. Yeah. Weirdly enough. Yeah, I've just like, given up on that shit. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, so I mean, my, my, my partner had uh like full dimple piercings that went through and then she had an issue with one of them got infected and then she was just like fuck it and took them both out she's like I'm not, i i I'll, maybe someday i'll do it again but it's so annoying that yeah uh usually yeah, i want to go back to those sticker earrings that you used to wear in like the 90s i don't know how old yeah, you are but yeah yeah, yeah. I'm, th I'm 30 do you remember yeah, i'm 30 Leonardo yeah. DiCaprio on them or something 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, the sticky ones. They're like they're like yeah. super adhesive, and you just pinch them now on each side. That's yeah. the extent of how edgy I I, I can. Hey, do. there you go. Yeah, I have I have like for my ears, I have gauges, so I'm I'm like at a double oh, zero yeah. right now. So, but I'm probably gonna go up a little bigger. I don't know how big I'll go, but I, I'm pretty. As you can tell with the tattoo, body mod stuff is like one of my big passions. Uh, I actually have plans for a uh, sleeve tattoo on my left hand or on my left arm, which is gonna be. Um, I love sleeve uh, tattoos. Very. Pop, they always but... look so cool. Yeah, it's going to take a while for me to save up the money for that one, but I'm pretty excited for it. So, well, yeah. Um, let's uh, introduce, like, the show. Absolutely. So, like, uh, um, thanks for coming. Like, we've, we've had a few talks before, um, and I've always thought that I, – I don't know if it goes both ways, but I've always thought that you were, like, incredibly smart and a really great debater. Um, and, Thank you. And, yeah, like, I just – I just, like, I don't know. I just find you super interesting, so I want to have a chat. Thank but, you. Oh, sorry about that. That's my phone. You're good. You're good. Don't worry about it. And, um, I, and I appreciate that a lot. Likewise, uh, I really enjoyed. Uh, I do recognize I was a little, a little spicy in our first one, but uh, I, I hope yeah. you'll forgive me. It's okay, for, everyone for... was spicy with me. It, it, it was, was a, little... a trial by fire. <laughs> that's how they go. That's that's the that's the debate sphere. Uh, I'm kind of yeah. known for being a little spicy sometimes, but I mean, I don't know. Like I have, there's certain things I get a little irked by, but uh, yeah, I have a lot of respect for you. I've seen you on a lot of panels, and I'm glad we're getting to talk. Um, you know, uh, yeah, same. always happy, um, always happy to get to talk with other fem fem presenting people in Twitch spaces. So, yeah, thank you for having yeah, me on. Because it's it's rare, especially in the political world. Yep. And I'm pretty opinionated, and you're very opinionated, and it's just I don't know. Like a lot of women in general are scared to be like that. So, um, for me, it's just also, it's just cool to have other role models that are doing the same thing. So I also like really appreciate that. I'm sure like all the other women in the chat and that I'm presenting and stuff like have feel the same way. Yeah. Well, um, um, I hope to see more and more over time. So, but yeah, so I'll just introduce the show. Um, Absolutely. every Monday and Wednesday, I sit down with someone I find super interesting and I do what I call an heiress talk, um, to highlight the story and kind of see how the personal connects with the political um since you tend to see all these characters uh in very i guess intense situations where we're all yelling at each other and sometimes it's just nice to get to know like why we have those opinions like and where they come from and just to have something a little more chill um i'll introduce myself i am a grad student in history and i love learning and engaging with i with ideas with like honesty and charity. Um, I'm also founder of Discord's biggest brain server, Cali Open Club. Um, but today we have Dean Wama, um, as you guys all know, um, one of the few prominent women in the online debate world and happens to be very good at it. So she tends to strike fear in lots of people's hearts. And just to be clear, like you're sorry, you're, I forgot to ask your pronouns. pronouns yeah, she I use she, right? her. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, thus, uh, you have gathered a not notorious reputation for that, which I feel like you've kind of cultivated, you know? I mean, to a degree, but at the same time, I think the name my... Steven. Yeah, the name Steven, Mom. Yeah, I mean, of course. I mean, I, I didn't really choose it for that reason, but, uh, I did sort of embrace it a little bit, sort of a, uh, following the, uh, the wear it like your armor uh sort of thing but i mean yeah i, I actually think, love I think it some, sometimes my my reputation outpaces the reality uh even even with my propensity for spice but but yes <laughs> well i think i don't know I, as i mentioned i just think it's so cool that you completely put yourself out there um you get spicy you don't you're not afraid to get dirty with the boys um True. and it's just like um, I don't know what other euphemism to hear to hear that, and like I, that's just something that I love doing too. And I was a little nervous about getting into it with Twitch, but yeah, it's just I don't know. It's with, just cool to see reason. another woman doing. I that mean, shit. there's a lot. It's rough. It's a rough space sometimes, and it's especially rough yeah. because uh, because the the boys club often doesn't take particularly nicely to uh people to to femme people who speak up. Um, and then they don't mm -hmm. really treat you with the same respect that they would treat other people, um, unfortunately, which we can talk about if you want to. I've talked about that uh, numerous times on stream. So feel free I'd to ask I'd love to get into that soon. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Because it's just, I don't know. There's, I, I, people often think that like sexism and transphobia and stuff, it comes in like, oh, I don't like you because you're a woman or you're trans. It, but it, in, in reality, it's, it's often much more subtle than that, um, mm -hmm. at least on like a day-to-day -day basis. 
um, in terms of like when you're meeting someone and talking to someone and debating with them, they'll often have like these subtle kind of micro ways of making you feel pretty shitty. Yeah, um, pe people laugh sometimes at the at the term like microaggression, but um, but they fucking add up. They really add yeah. up. No, they um, do. Yeah, and like when you get a whole bunch of uh, when you when you when you do something that's like half as spicy as as uh, everybody else on the panel and get twice the shit for it, just because you're the only femme on the panel, like, yeah, it starts yep. to feel a little crappy. I know what that's like. And I feel like you do too. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, I'm sure like you've been in debates where say you've taken on say the same position as someone like Vosh, but people treated like you, like you were the one with the really crazy position, even though it was the exact same. Uh, yeah, I had an entire like cancellation cycle. Uh, I, I don't use that word lightly because, uh, uh, you know, I don't know. It gets used to hell. But I had a whole fucking session of people trying to fucking destroy my channel because of that, which we can. Again, I think you Could said you tell you me a bit wanna... about that. I can if you'd like. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. So because I'm new to this world, so I don't know a lot about what happened before. Yeah. yeah um, so the well, OK, uh, I would say that I've had like probably two like what I would what I would say reached the level of cancellations where people were like actually calling for me to be deplatformed and all kinds of things like that. The first one was the result of I really didn't expect the first one at all. Well, actually, I, to be completely honest, I didn't expect either of them, though. Uh, I didn't the first one that ever happened. I like I didn't even expect after the debate got a little bit spicy. Um, and uh, it was this whole thing where. Uh, I was having a debate with somebody and it, it started pretty good for the first like hour and a half. It was like pretty low key and not spicy at all. And then a few things were exchanged back and forth and it got kind of spicy. But afterwards, the result of that conversation was somebody published a manifesto on me that got oh, uh, no. like the dreaded manifesto. Yeah, dreaded manifesto. And it was incredibly dishonest. And it sort of wrapped up by saying that I was like a danger to women and stuff because um which is a huge stretch because the argument, the, the debate that we were talking about was like, um, it was like whether, uh, like it, it was, it started about whether like using someone as a friend is the same thing as using someone for sex. And then it kind of like branched from there and got into other topics. Um, and we got into some like weird entitlement stuff, like about um, specifically talking about how like a lot of, it is the experience of a lot of women that um, they feel like sort of passively pressured all the time that any mm -hmm. like any kindness that they show towards any like random guy is going to be picked up as flirting. And that was then, you know, confirmed in the conversation. And I was like, well, you see how this is like playing into that. Right. And then it sort of spun into this whole thing where all of a sudden I was a bad feminist because for some reason, because I I didn't acknowledge the part that women had even though i never said anything about that because we were talking about it. and it turned into this whole thing and um i ended up just getting i was really a, like i was a pretty small channel i hadn't even crossed 100 average viewers now i pull like somewhere between 150 and 250 uh depending mm -hmm. on the day and stream um but at the time i hadn't even crossed 100 and uh i was getting like a thousand like i got like a thousand comments on one of my videos and most of them were Holy severely shit. negative um and then of That's course gotta I, do shit to your mental health too oh it was right? terrible like plan. yeah i was not even ready for it and like the thing is is like i consider myself somebody with a pretty thick skin um like i i'm pretty good to deal but like that scale I, i've never talked to a thousand people at the same time let alone had a thousand plus people commenting and of course it, that was only on youtube if you consider all the other platforms i was getting bombarded on twitter i i couldn't even go on reddit because uh like reddit was just if i even looked into the reddits that i usually follow there was a lot of people talking about mm -hmm. me um and then that whole incident sort of set up for the second one which was the one that you asked me about the whole rgr situation um, mm -hmm. and that turned into a, that was like a, a totally unplanned random debate between me and yeah, you guys Arja. were just like hanging out, yep. um, and just like chilling and then, yeah. yeah. It, and then it, this just, it just happened into a debate, right? Like, yeah. Accidentally. Um, basically we were, we were literally memeing at first. Like I had not even planned to have her on. We were just kind of like, you know, you know how it happens sometimes in streaming. Somebody pops by like, Hey, you want to chat? And we're like, yeah, let's do it. Come on. And then we started chit chatting and we were having a fake debate about, uh, Godzilla versus King Kong. 
um, which was like a, has been a, a meme, yeah, a big meme in, lately because of the movie and everything. And so, uh, and I have a pretty strong pro Kong position. Um, and so we were having fun with that. But then uh, at some point, it it turned into this whole thing. And um, after that, like I realized having been through the first whole ringer, I was like, okay, there's, there's a chance that this is going to become like a huge, a huge deal. So, you know, my approach to that was like, we, we locked the VOD. We were just like, nope, mm -hmm. it wasn't planned. This wasn't planned content. This is like a, like a, this became a really personal fight. We're not going to fucking play on this, but, uh, other people involved did not decide to do that. And it went s like hyper viral. And, um and by the end of it like the vod like i mean i don't even know by the end but like by the time that i had published my um like i did a response video about it um mm -hmm. is all that i did and that was like four days after the debate and i had been radio silent i even canceled my streams i was just like i'm just sitting this one out but i realized that there was a it was getting to the point where people were just totally like mis mischaracterizing everything about me um and so i made a response and by the time i had made a response uh, over a hundred thousand people had seen just one of the vods of the of the very long vods that was made about me uh that was claiming all kinds of things that i'd never said there was this narrative on twitter on twitter i was being i literally just logged out of twitter completely because i was getting tagged so frequently with this idea with people saying that i'm a transphobe that i'm like a disgusting subhuman piece of shit like oh you know God. just genuinely horrible harassment All, every single platform was totally choked out and uh and that was by the time that i had put my response up and then i put my response up and i didn't do anything until the next monday and then i just resumed my normal streaming um, and didn't really talk about it much. Now I've, since then, you know, now that we've gotten some distance with it, um, you know, I've, I've, uh, I've weighed in about the different, the drama and the cancellation aspect since, but it was super unpleasant. It was like, uh, one of the most like lopsided, unfair, like again, small channel at that point, you know, again, I hadn't yeah. even reached these numbers and I was a little bigger than I was the first time, but we're talking, a ch we were talking channels that have 120 times my viewership or 120 times and, and and like huge huge gap just focusing on me for eight hours of stream time 16 hours of stream time um and just just saying the worst shit you can imagine about me and then their fans are like we gotta do we gotta take care of this person it was just like holy shit so i yeah. just wish people would look when they're doing like react andy content and just anything like that i just wish people would remember that there's like someone actually behind that computer. Yeah. There's like literally, it, even if someone said something that you think is incorrect or you think is harmful, um, it doesn't you like it doesn't necessarily mean um, that that person is like a terrible person. They deserve to be harassed. Um, you know, like I the, the jump that people take with online figures is just crazy to me. Yeah. Um, well, I I think there's a couple of like key things that happens. Um, like I mean all. Obviously, the internet is like, unfortunately, for the last like five years, been kind of infamous for widespread harassment. I think like the Gamergate saga kind of yeah. uh, made that a thing that hasn't gone away yet. Um, and uh, but uh, there's this there's a certain way of uh, that some people respond to videos and the way things are framed that I think are like is like are arguably irresponsible like like pretty irresponsible um and and it, it does frustrate me especially because there is this effect where nobody uh nobody even tries to give charitability to the person who's just not the person that they go to watch you know what i mean and so yeah. it, it goes beyond even being political disagreements because to a certain degree you can understand like okay if you have significant political disagreements if somebody's advocating for the total opposite worldview of you you can understand people being pretty mad but a lot of times mm -hmm. it's not that it's just they're not your favorite streamer and your favorite streamer said that they're bad and therefore we're gonna go hog wild on this person and they yep. stop seeing you as a human and they just i mean i can't even begin to tell you like the 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 dregs of the types of comments and 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 dms and we had to lock down our discord it took like it took it basically killed two weeks of my streaming career because of of how horrible and it doesn't help you at all you don't gain anything from it that's the thing like some people are like oh you're t churning up drama you gain nothing 
if you if you come across like like if you get bombed by like a keemstar or some equivalent on a different part of the internet um hmm. those people don't stick they don't follow you they don't sub to you they don't give you money they don't do anything they just harass you yeah and then it's they not leave. like real additions to your yeah, you don't get shit. anything your video your yeah. video might get some extra views and some extra comments and shit but that doesn't do anything in the algorithm in the long run. And the the toll on your – the the fact that you're unable to use social media just starts it, – it makes life hell. It really does. And thankfully, I've gotten a lot better um, at, like, dealing with social media. Um, but the reality yeah, is, like – practice is a big thing in this world, right? Yeah, like just absolutely. Just, like, learning from your previous mistakes. Uh, but at the same time, like, I also know that, like, if I – if this had happened to me, like, five – 10 years ago if i had happened to start streaming earlier in my life i probably wouldn't have handled it nearly as well and it would have been very easy for it to perpetuate for much longer and just have just completely wrecked my mental health and i will say that the second now the first one sucked and it was stressful but i was able to get through it the second one was so overwhelming like more people saw me getting like like not just not just lightly trash on like completely and utterly insulted and debased by another streamer who was just like fucking piece of trash like this person is just terrible and like a danger to everybody just the the, the claims were so ridiculous more people than have like ever seen my work saw that video and that is like a, a type That's of numbers that your brain can't really get you know, it's like, oh, like, what do I do? Like, do I just, should I just close up shop? And the answer is no, don't close up shop because uh, those people have really short attention spans. Um, but it, it, it is, it's pretty stressful. And I will say that I struggled with that for a while and it took me, you know, uh, getting back into streaming, like it, it took me a couple streams for, before I was feeling like I was even close to where with the level of comfort I was just because there was this part of my brain that was constantly thinking about like, Oh shit, is this, am I going to say something off random in the stream and it's going to result in like another wave of, of harassment? Is it going to result in me having to lock down again? Yeah. It creates this toxic culture of fear. Totally. Um, yeah. Yep. That, that stuff. Like, I wonder if, because you've had conflict with other streamers, like mm. I think like destiny, but um, there did seem to be like something particularly sad about like this conflict between uh you and riley right yeah um, i mean i agree and that was like yeah that was just way more hurtful um yeah it was i mean and and the thing is i mean of course like the trouble got the trouble the true trouble like for me at least uh at least the 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 like when it got really bad was when other people got involved because you know a falling out with with somebody is that's very... always how it works it just of makes course. it so much worse yeah it always makes it worse especially when that person is a big yeah. and influential streamer and uh also hates your guts um but uh like in that particular case yeah it, it was very i i agree it was really sad and like it was really sad for me personally i've i don't think i've ever had a moment where i've been so emotionally compromised by the end of a conversation that I needed to end stream, but I did that night. And if you, if a lot of people never mm -hmm. saw that because a lot of it was not, you know, my side was not seen because I chose to say like, Hey, like I hope that we can have a ceasefire and work our things out in the future. Obviously that's not what happened. Um, but, and because of that, uh, nobody saw my side of it, but, uh, or anything I said afterwards, but after that, like I literally stopped stream because it was, I, I fucking broke down. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, and, and so it wasn't was the debate me. wasn't on anything just casual, right? It was no. on something really intense, like one of probably one of the most important issues, like of of the day, right? Yeah. So I understand, like that there were, and it, what seemed to me, like when I when I watched it, it seemed like she was feeling like you were talking down to her mm -hmm. and you were feeling like, and correct me if I'm wrong. And you were feeling like she was having to justify the existence of being trans. Well, and I so mean, that was sort of, there was I... both like this defensive kind of feeling that there just was, created this sure. toxic atmosphere. I mean, part of it, the, the, that was sort of my, my, you know, feeling at the end was like and a lot of people latched onto that and really uncharitably interpreted what i said there um i think like like uh in uncharitably to the degree of just absolutely lying about what i said um but uh but like most of what i was frustrated about about on my side about that conversation was i felt like i couldn't leave um and like the, i actually have there is that's interesting it was yeah well, like, I, and I that, that's really that interesting too. that you say yeah like uh if you want me to explain like what where i was with that 
uh, yeah. in that place. Like, like take well, me into your head sure. in that moment, right? A- absolutely, um, because yeah. Because I feel like a lot of people have been had those experiences, but privately, like when with their friends, right? Yeah, and it, it's like there was, a, and that's part of the reason. By the way, since then, I have revised my internal rules uh, of how I do my show um, as a result of something I learned from that conversation. Um, and it, it was, uh, which was that I made a, 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 a sort of rule for myself that like, uh, if anybody, if people push past me telling them no once, then I will end the show. If I'm not being respected on my own show, I will just, I, I don't care. Like, even if they're my friend, um, or, or somebody who I respect a lot, the show, like I have to have the ability to end something on my terms on my show. Um, and, and then I also gave my, uh, lead mods the ability to, if something like that's happening again, and it doesn't seem like I've caught on to it to kick me out of the voice call. <laughs> so, so that it can at least cause a break on the show. And cause I'd rather have You're a probably not in a place like mentally to be able to say, to even like tell yourself, no, this is not a good idea. To yeah. Continue I now. wasn't that time. I think in the future I will be, um, hopefully, um, but it's like, but but in that one i didn't i was totally blindsided and and i can explain where where this was so like when it first started it was very fun and i invited a friend somebody who i had our discord was partnered with her discord which is like a there's this whole thing we've been doing with discord partnerships where and we're actually working on finally getting another uh, uh, two more set up um basically they're sort of informal partnerships where you have a channel devoted on each server to your partner servers generally you look for the goal is to find servers that are similar to yours um Mm -hmm. and you generate a special link in a blurb so that people who are like bored on a day i'm not streaming or whatever can go to the discord partnership channel and find another channel that they will have a good time in and we were partners with rgr um and we even had uh like we had assigned emissaries from from like we called it that for fun, but it's like we had designed mods who were guest mods from the other communities so we could get to know each other. And actually it was but, super like we were allies. Yeah. It probably was like, why it was particularly harmful. Yeah. And it was it was like we had this whole thing and, and so uh, you know, there was a lot of stuff there. I mean, I, I covered for her stream once where she raided into me and I, I off the blue on a day I wasn't streaming and I was like, all right, let me get on. I'll raid. I'll take care of your viewers and I'll send them back to you afterwards. So they stay entertained while you go do something. So we had a lot of history and whatnot. Um, like I wouldn't say we were like IRL friends, but we were definitely professional like friends. And, uh, and so we started getting into this and the debate kind of came out of nowhere. And in, in the debate, I actually went back and I've watched it of course, many times since then. And I was actually, originally I said it was three times. You've done that. Right? What's that? Like, I think that, that I admire that you've actually rewatched it, right? Because I'm sure yeah. that's challenging, but I'm sure you have good reasons to do it. Uh, I, I, there are some, there's some content of mine that I never rewatch because it's just like, uh, like, it's like the Johnny Depp thing. It's like, it's weird to watch yourself do stuff. But, but when it's something that's like where there's a lot of contentious, a uh, contention or something where a lot of people seem to think I did something wrong, I go back and I try to figure out where that's coming from and what I can do to improve what I did wrong and stuff like that. And, and if there's, and whether, or whether or not it's something totally different that maybe people are, I don't know. I used to be a writer and there was this saying that was, um, if, if people, if like, if you, uh, if people read something and they tell you how to fix it, they're almost always, wrong on how to fix it but they're almost right they're almost always right that there's something wrong they just don't usually know what because they're not like a writer so they will say like i hated this thing and it's like okay well you should do this it's okay well ignore that part but find out what it was that they were bothered by and if there's something that you can do about that um so i do try to do that and i have watched it and there was four separate times where i explicitly said like hey like i want to like let's let's end this you know like like i don't want to have this conversation but there was a a, you have to answer this. The, you have to answer this question. I need you to answer this question. Was the, like the terminology that was used over and over again, and so it got to the point where I felt like I was being severely inquisitive. And I think that the language that was used there was very rational for me to come to that conclusion. Um, for me to conclude that I'm being told like you have to answer this question, and there's an implicit threat or what? You know what I mean? I have to answer. You need. I wonder. I, it seemed like she was feeling threatened too, right? Like just to um steel man here like it seemed like she was feeling threatened to you because she felt like your tone was and i mean and i you know this right like lots of women are just very um sensitive to getting talked down to 
So, yeah, I mean, I think there was parts where, where that was mutual. Yeah. Like, I mean, I think for me, the first part where I know that I like, I identified that I got really defensive. And I even talk about this in my response video. Um, mm -hmm. Like, I felt really defensive when I was told that like, uh, right, like at the beginning, it's like, oh, well, like you need to be responsible with your platform. So I need you to answer this question because if you're not, then you're not, you're, you're putting out bad information or whatever. And I'm like, uh, I feel like that, I, you know, I, I felt like that was really out of line. And then that's where the line where I was like, well, you're being cringe right now. And so that was a little bit sarcastic and sassy and whatever. And I acknowledge that it was mm -hmm. a defensive thing to say. Um, but also there was never any point where I implied that like her platform was bad, that she was a dangerous person. And that was not returned to me. Um, and there was this continual pushing to make me answer questions, even though I'm like, I don't want to have this conversation. Let's have this another time. I am on, I, there was one point where I literally said, I'm like, I'm at hour nine of my stream. So I'd really like to not have a debate at this time of night when I'm nine hours into a yeah. stream, but it couldn't happen. And, uh, while I, acknowledge that like i should have ended the call like forcibly and and that's what was said like oh you should well then you know if, if, if the defense that when people brought up like hey like demon mama did try to end the call multiple times was well you know demon mama should have just hung up but i think you can understand like i don't know i just always ask people when people bring that up to me i'm like okay say you're having an argument with your friend and you hang up the phone you probably just you probably just totally fucked up your relationship with your friend if you're having an argument with your friend and you just fucking hang up the phone that's a bad call, right? Like, I think that's, mm -hmm. if you get hung up on, that's considered a pretty major slight. But this is more, even worse than that, because I had 150 people watching and she had yeah, 150 true. people watching. So there's like, it's not only that, I'm making a show for people and like, what, I hang up and then all of a sudden just end the show? Like, it's 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 not very, it, in my opinion, that's a very uncomfortable position to be in, especially when you ask four times and there's no answer. And I, I recognize now that like, yes, I should have. But it's also kind of like, it's it's kind of weird to me, like when somebody tells you, oh, you should have just forced me out of the call. Like, well, maybe you shouldn't have put, maybe you shouldn't have been like creating those circumstances in the first place. Um, yeah, like and, there's, you know, she was putting pressure on you to continue the conversation and yeah. also implying that you were doing something really dangerous. So like the, so I can understand that. Yeah, she saw it as like, this is really important. This has to, and she probably wasn't thinking like, I'm bridging, like I'm crossing someone's boundaries. Yeah. And, but in a way she still did. But like, so I want to get into um, one of the criticisms she, she, that you brought up that sure. she, that she had yeah. about her specifically saying that you, um, you were irresponsible, you have been irresponsible with your platform mm -hmm. or you were continuing to be, I think. Yeah. Um, so I'm guessing you don't think, about, you don't think that you've been irresponsible with your Not platform about this topic, nope. but are there any situations like in the past um, that you feel like you could have done better or you have been irresponsible, I guess, like with this unique platform you have? Yeah, um, absolutely. There's been a few times actually. Um, but the one that I, the one that I always remember because it was such a huge learning moment for me was thankfully when I was a much smaller channel, um, I had a conversation with a, uh, a sort of um, infamous uh, Twitter ML um, and I did not do enough research and they actually spouted quite a lot of misinformation um, that I didn't catch mm -hmm. because I didn't know um, because I was too wait at that point I was like too trusting and I was not take I didn't take it as seriously and I actually got called out really hard by a bigger streamer out of the blue and after that, like I was pretty embarrassed and I, but I literally was like, at the end of it, I was like, Hey, I, I really appreciate you calling me out on this. I need to think about it more. Uh, but you know, I appreciate you holding me to task. And that actually changed my approach to interviews altogether. Um, and, uh, so Did they that... call you out in like a specific way that you were more open to taking it constructively. Uh, to be honest, not really. Nope. Um, I went, I went on to just have a chat with them and then they sprung it on me kind of out of nowhere. <laughs> so they, they kind of pulled a dirty move, but again, like it, it felt fair, you know, it felt kind of fair to me because I was like, yeah, I did fuck up. You know what I mean? And I'm also yeah. like, uh, I've, you know, I, again, I'm 30, so I have like a little bit of a, of an Same. age. Yeah. Oh, sick. Like I have a little bit of an age advantage over a lot of people in the streaming world. So I've, I've taken a lot of like, uh, like tough pills in my life 
leading up to this point. Yeah. And as a result, it was like, okay, yeah, I can see that I was wrong there. I'm a little bit faster than a lot of people to admit when they're wrong. Um, but that was one where it was like, yeah, I think I, I think I'm glad that I didn't do that. I'm glad I learned that lesson when I was smaller before my platform was really meaningfully large, um, because I wouldn't want to do that again. Um, and then, uh, I mean, I think that there was a fair criticism in, uh, in, uh, the, the first little cancellation, uh, that happened. I was pretty spicy with the titling after the fact, and I probably shouldn't mm. have been that spicy. Um, like, I, I I don't know. Like titling on tw on YouTube is is pretty commonly. It's like bit... flirting with the devil, right? Because yeah, but... it wants you to do something. It's in it's incentivizing you to do something that you know is probably bad. But yeah, I mean, yeah. it's there's a, like everybody does the clickbait stuff. Uh, and and so I didn't really think of it much at that time. But I've been I've been more careful with people who are like, uh, less deserving of ire. I I still don't feel like obviously I don't think that that justifies anything that happened, but. I have mm -hmm. learned from that. And I think that like, was I wrong on that? Yes. Did it justify me getting like, did a YouTube ch like title that was slightly, slightly uncharitable, uh, justify. I mean, they didn't even know about the YouTube channel when the, when the manifesto was done. So it's not like what I did was actually like, they were already firing back before I even did that thing. But at the same time, I don't, I would avoid, you know, adding fire in that way in the future because I, I don't know, like I just, it was a little too much. And so I've learned, I've learned quite a bit about that. And then of course, um, I mean, there's been a couple of times, um, again, a lot of these were earlier on, um, in my, uh, streaming career, there was a couple of times where, uh, like I went into a debate underprepared and I feel like I, uh, failed. Um, there was one debate where I sort of jumped into a really spicy debate that was, uh, going on on Chud Logic's channel and I fucked up yeah. my point really hard. And I don't think like, I don't think I was wrong, but I fucked up my point really hard. And that's happened to me so many times. Yeah, so and and totally so it. it was one where I was like, ah, oh, God damn it. Like, it's really hard to come back from that because if you are right, but you, but you get the point wrong really bad. It's really hard. You to feel go like back. you've caused harm, right? Yeah, as well and, because and, you've given like this false impression. Yeah, I yeah, totally get that. Precisely. Yeah, you got it. And and so those are some of the ones where I've felt like I've uh I've I've really done, like I've I've fucked up and have had to go back and learn. And like I think there's probably going to be. I mean, obviously, I imagine there's going to be other mistakes I make in the future. Um, obviously everybody does, but, um, I've also mm. learned a lot and I've learned really quick and, uh, I'm not afraid to admit when I'm wrong. Um, and yeah, I wish more people were like that. I don't know. Like yeah. that. I, I wish we would allow people to be wrong and not just assume like sometimes someone says something that's incorrect or sometimes mm. like someone, I don't know. I've seen someone like, uh, post an article that they didn't realize was say like from like a turf website or something. Yeah. Um, and uh and everyone just like yells at them turf when in reality they were just wrong like they just they got, got and sent the wrong article and they yeah. were just incorrect and sometimes you just need to focus instead of like the the moral aspect just focus on like education just Absolutely. correct the person tell them why they're wrong yeah um i i definitely think there's a there's a essentialization problem specifically on twitter um where people get essentialized yeah. <laughs> from like making a bad argument into being a thing um and yeah i i it's a mess. <laughs> yes. So yeah, I, I feel you on so that. So what? Sure. Uh, what got you into like this whole debate universe, especially with YouTube and Twitch and stuff? Um. Well, it's a weird path. So, uh, in the short, if like if you want the like the like what actually got me into doing streaming specifically, um, that would be Vosh. Um, to be completely honest, if I'm completely honest, um, uh, I hear it's pronounced Vosh, right? Vosh. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's like, so, um, no, Vosh, Vosh, uh, I was a big fan of Vosh, um, before I started streaming, um, like OG chatter back in the Twitch days, um, followed Vosh for a long time. And then what by... did uh, you like about him in particular? Oh, um, well, there's a couple of things. Well, like, obviously, uh, I've always, so I've always been a fan of debate, like, um, a lot like a lot like i used to debate i can with... tell by the way you debate that yeah you're like a fellow <laughs> debate nerd because it's fun right yep yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a nerd now i now 
I've told people that I'm kind of a pit fighter in a lot of ways in that like the type of debate I never did formal debate I never did debate team mm -hmm. although I have debated yeah neither with, did I yeah I've debated with people who are on debate teams so I've learned a bit of the of the way to engage and I've learned a lot from that my my best friend for a long time was like a national level debate team person like like she was super good at that shit uh, she went to like a private school and did debate team and got to the national level and was like really good at that so I had a lot of practice um but like, I mean, I, I used to debate, like I started arguing with like being really super, I mean, I was always told I was an argumentative child. Um, but when I was younger, like in my teens, um, my family, we had this, my family's really fucking weird. I will say that much, but we had this weird, uh, culture of arguing at, at family gatherings and it was heavily encouraged. And the goal and the, the thing that was like constantly repeated, even though it, it was only true to a certain degree, um, was that like, oh, you argue and then you, you sit down and have dinner together afterwards. You know what I mean? And everybody's, yeah, are, everybody's are you good. Are any chance? Cause that's like a big Jewish tradition. I'm uh, not, very um, I'm not, believe it or not. But, um, but, uh, <laughs> I would say there's some cultural uh, overlap, at least family-wise, with with my yeah. with my family. Um, because yeah, I've been I've been asked that before, but it's like it was intense. We would get really intense, and uh, I used to argue all kinds of stuff. I was actually at the time because I I grew up super conservative. I was actually um pretty fucking conservative and i usually argued from conservative oh, wow. positions when That's i was a hard kid for me to imagine yeah i mean it is it was well i mean that whole background is a whole thing. I'm actually working on a, a really big video that's going to be a pretty huge deal for my channel, I'm hoping, um, soon, which is going to be talking about – It's called. It's, uh, it was inspired by – are you familiar with Good Mythical Morning? The uh, YouTube channel. Okay, they're like a they're like a massive YouTube channel. They used to be known by Rhett and Link. Um, they're like famous, like massive YouTube channel. Really, really cool. But they have a podcast called Ear Biscuits where they talk about more personal stuff. And – uh, last year they did a video called, uh, our spiritual deconstruction. And basically they talked about, um, their experiences growing up really religious and how they both like sort of independently came to not be religious anymore and how it was this huge process. It was super amazing. And it resonated with me a lot because I grew up in a, f a f extremist Christian sect, uh, a cult, mm -hmm. frankly. Um, and, uh, there was a lot that resonated with me, even though their story was even less intense than mine, but we went through a lot of similar, er like, like arcs, you know, in this process of leaving this extremist religion and all this stuff. So I'm doing my own. Um, and I've talked about it before on stream, but never in like one big session. Um, so that's going to be coming up eventually. I'm going to be doing the demon mama, um, spiritual deconstruction where I'm going to walk through like what I, what I grew up with what it was like being in the church, how I came to challenge those beliefs and grow as a person, and then how I left the church and left the faith entirely and came to become a lot happier as a result of that. Um, but it's going to be a yeah, very for me, I thing. was also a part of like this kind of um, Jewish, very like Orthodox kind of cult-like environment. And yeah. for me, like the biggest thing that pushed me out of it, because I think I've always had like this, I guess, conservative instinct, um, uh, just in the philosophical like way uh, mm. that I, I like tradition. I like um, just inherently and I like uh, habits and yeah. an intense structure like around my life. It's like something that I really enjoy. And so Orthodox Judaism provided that. So in a way, like I should have stayed in terms of those instincts, but the way women were treated in that world, it was just like, especially like the if you think that the west is gender essentialist like you should go to this universe i'm telling you like they literally put up fences at in, like at weddings where the bride can't dance with her husband yeah. um so i was literally segmented and away from any population of so-called men um and yeah the shit that they put on you and everything like i was just like holy shit, i cannot live my life like this yeah, it's interesting too because um, th it's interesting you bring that up because um, one of the things I'm going to be talking about is one of the areas where my story differs pretty majorly from like the one of like the the Good Mythical Morning guys because one of the things they talked mm -hmm. about and and they touched on this as well which made me go like wow like actually super interesting to hear somebody else's perspective because they were like 
you know, a lot of people, they, one of the things they talked about is like a lot of people have like traumatic moments associated with the church, which was definitely true for myself. Um, yep. and they were like, I, they were like, you know, something that bothered me for a long time is like, I didn't really ever have that. And it wasn't until this, like they talked about how, um, cause they did a year follow up, and they talked about how they kind of had been thinking one of the things they wanted to touch on in their follow up to it was how they'd never really realized that like it bothered them that they're like, you know, so many people have had this traumatic experience, but to me, it wasn't like that. And then, you know, specifically, uh, Rhett was like, but I, I came to realize like the church had been built for me. It had been built for white, straight, cis guys. And so mm -hmm. for me, all I got was good stuff. It, it didn't end up fit, being fitting. And I'm happy that I'm not a part of it anymore because it's, because for me, it's like, I, it was bothering me that it wasn't true. There were these truth issues that were guiding me through this. But for a lot of other people, their critique starts before they ever even get to talk about the truth thing because they have these experiences. And it is interesting mm -hmm. that you say that because like there were certain things about um, like life and, and, and reality that I had to relearn in a different context that were things that benefited me in the church. For example, like, I mean, I'm a pretty, uh, I'm a pretty ambitious person. Right. And, uh, like I am kind of a little bit of a workaholic and, and this, like the Christian work ethic was very much a part of me. And that sort of stuff is rewarded in the church. Um, and, and as a result, like there was this period of my life where I really struggled to find direction and purpose and, and motivation because previously there had been this God and there was this fire in me. Like I used to describe myself like I, I was the paladin class. I was like, I'm ready. I'm going to go out and I'm going to do great things in the name of God. Like I'm going to go make movies yeah. <laughs> that are for the glory of God. And so these things were like, they fueled me really well, but I couldn't coexist with the church being uh queer frankly yep. um i didn't belong uh their gender prescriptions were totally fucked for me because of course most of my time in the church was before transition I was very unhappy and i chafed at the things that they wanted me to be and do and uh and then also um i had friends who were gay and i realized that this church was pressuring me to hate them and i didn't want to hate them and so I found myself struggling. Like, I mean, there was this moment that, I'm in, that I talked about a couple times on stream where I remember it was right before I stopped believing in, in religion altogether. And a friend of mine who was super close came out to me. And I remember having like, all, like almost a um, panic attack. I was standing in this uh, football pitch, like a, like a soccer pitch. And I was walking and talking on the phone with my friend and she was like, she came out to me and I was like, my mouth went dry. I was like panicking, you know, because I was like happy for her. I was super happy for her, but there was this part of my mind that was like, but the religion. And I, that, and that was such like an emotional shock for me of going like, no, I'm happy and I'm going to choose to def And I chose in that moment to kind of defy my religious instinct. Which was a, a, a revolutionary moment for me. Yeah, it was like and somebody that's in chat so just said hard God too. Is well. Yeah, like that must have been like so hard because your family is probably entrenched really deeply in it. Were there any consequences for you, like by leaving it, like at least yes. on an outwardly? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Um. Uh. In fact, uh, you're getting the deep cuts here, the deep demon mama lore. But I guess that's what these sorts of things are for, right? Yeah. <laughs> um. But like, in fact, the name demon mama partially comes from the repercussions of that event um when i came out to my family um and decided i was going to leave the church because obviously transition in the church is impossible so these things were entrenched you know what i mean i could never be who mm -hmm. i was and also coexist with the church were that... you coming out as trans at that yes, moment came out as trans okay. yep and um and I had already sort of been distancing myself from the church at that point, but not from the faith entirely. So they, it was kind of like, you know, I could kind of keep it quiet and be like, oh yeah, I've been doing my reading and everything like that, you know, because I'm away from home at college and, and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and, but it, it it's, in, it's, un, it's impossible to de disentangle those things, you know, when you're in a church that tells you that gay people are evil and, and, and trans people especially are like, whoa, what the fuck are you doing? You know what I mean? Like they were totally. Did they even that. teach you what trans people were? Like, was nope. there any image that you'd 
grown up with of associated with that? Nothing. In fact, it was so it was so wild that like I, I mean, uh, it, it was so wild. Like the only image I ever had of uh, uh, at all of trans people whatsoever. Um, until I went to college and got out of the bubble and l met other people was uh, a one night when I was traveling with my dad. Um, and I think this was, I think this happened when we were in Germany. My dad fell asleep with the TV on and I kept watching because I couldn't sleep. And a documentary about intersex people came on and I was like, the fuck? And I was like, that exists? Like what? And so I couldn't stop watching it. And that was stuck in my head forever. But it didn't make sense because obviously, like, I was, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not, like, as far as I know, like, uh, I'm not intersex. But, um, but like, so, I, but I was like, well, like, there's, there was a resonance there with the people, with the stories that were being told in that. But I didn't have any idea that trans people were everything. I didn't even know the words. Um, because, you know, again, Christian bubble. Um, yeah, and how did you get the language to kind of, um, to, to learn how to describe how you were feeling? Um, well, it was very strange because, uh, what happened was, uh, I had a very close friend who came out to me and, and you'll notice I had two friends come out to me. One is gay and one is trans. Um, mm -hmm. and both of those were hugely influential on me, but the friend who came out to me as trans, um, like we had been friends for some time and, and, uh, we were super, like, we were super aligned like there were so much similarities between us mm -hmm. and um and when they were telling me the story i was like there was this part that was it was really funny and i, I laugh about it i'm like well you know like i feel that way like why are you worrying so much about it and then there was just this like literal awkward silence and then i was like uh, uh oh and uh so that's there was this really awkward moment there and then i started to learn from her all of this stuff about being trans and that was the first time i'd ever even known this world existed i was the first time i ever knew any of it i didn't even know that there was hrt the only thing i'd ever heard of was like pop culture like cross-dressing kind of stuff and yeah. i could like i could my my it's like everything just clicked into line it was like it made sense all of a sudden to me in this way that was like so this is what i've been fucking suffering with all the time all this time and there had actually like i mean of course there had been other there'd been all kinds of other things that had happened in my life that i had no way to express them at all uh i like i i was struggling with gender at age nine at that was like that not even before that to be completely honest but it was very um when i was younger um my family had this weird thing where like when i was super young we weren't super religious and then we joined the cult and it got super yeah. bad um so when i was super young my parents just let me do whatever. And uh, like I had basically no gender friction when I was super young, very, very little. Um, uh, and then when, and then it became this whole thing where all of a sudden once, uh, once we got into the religion, there was a lot of attention put on the way that I was because I, when I was young, my best friend, my, my two, actually my two first best friends for the entire first like 10 years of my life were girls and i spent time with them all the time we play i played with their toys we we had our own things and of course like i'm not like a like obviously i had my own things that i was interested in i wasn't like like i don't believe in like gender essentialism or anything like that mm -hmm. but there was this we were very very like as far as emotionally and the way that they had been socialized we we communicated a lot and that suddenly stopped to be allowed you know what i mean as scrutiny was put on me as i got older and then it started to become very apparent to me at nine that there was like things wrong and i remember learning about uh puberty in in like uh middle schools or era uh you know when the classes that must were, have been terrifying it was yeah like it was, it was it. weird for me because i was like I was like, I want like, it was like looking at a, a a catalog and I'm like, I want that one. And I used to pray to God that I would have a female puberty. And that didn't make any sense to me. You know what I mean? I just thought, okay, like whatever. And I actually remember uh, a, a, there was a moment with one of my friends where I told them like, uh, we were just, we had like a sleepover and I was talking about, like, we were just t hanging out, talking about random shit. And I was like, do you ever wish you were a girl? And they were like, they like weird chant me really hard. And I was like, no, nah, I was just kidding. Like, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And it was like, but it was like literally like a real life weird chant moment. They were just like, and I'm like, okay, nobody else thinks like this. I get it. I get it. Just kidding. Bye. And then I like, but again, no words to describe that. So I just thought I was a little weird, you know? Um, yeah. So 
yeah, when I got those words, when I finally connected with somebody who was trans and they were a friend, not like a very close friend, somebody who we talked about everything. Um, and someone it, like, you admire as yeah, well. Yeah, right? precisely. Yeah, somebody who like was instrumental in me escaping the like sort of mental traps of religion as well because they were willing to like because we had so much rapport even though we had very different beliefs at that point uh we would talk for hours into the night about philosophy about religion we would go back and forth and so it only made sense that after that we would talk about gender as well and i learned all this stuff and they gave me resources and they connected with me with people and i was able to talk to a psychologist about it until my family found out and then it was really bad um yeah. and yeah the re repercussions from that were pretty severe uh to tie it back around i kind of went on a tangent there but the name demon mama came from the fact that um once my family started finding out uh of course the the the, the flavor of debates at, at at family dinners would change and there was a lot of awkwardness and some really weird moments and stuff but there was this one time where i was arguing about the bible um and i knew the bible real well uh, in fact, like arguably I was one of the most like previously pious people in my family. Um, mm -hmm. And we got into this one argument and it was like literally a 5v1. I had like my aunt, my grandma, two of my cousins and another one of my aunts. And one of my aunts was like, you know, I can't help but feel like you're a servant of Satan who's been sent to 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 confuse us no with way. all your nonsense. Did yeah. she really say Yeah, that? she literally said that. And that's where I got the demon name because I, after that I was like, okay, like that's too funny like for me to like so i used i started using demon so that's a lot literally of what you things. said you wear it as, as a shield yep wear it that as a shield sense. yeah and uh yeah they said i was like a servant of satan and and because i was i was stumping them because they didn't know the bible very well like let's be real most people don't most people who believe it don't really actually research it but me i've i've got my and it's going to be up on my shelf i have a fucking monster four four edition side-by-side -side study bible that i was planning on like that was going to be my that was my guiding book i carried it with me like to every place that i went it was it's marked up with notes like i was very serious about religion and so you know for them like it was threatening the idea that like the most pious person in the family no longer believed but i think that's how it goes sometimes when the further you dig into some of these religious texts the more you start to think about them and you find problems with them yeah. yeah, and you start seeing all the all the issues where it's not like consistent, and um, yeah, like for me, it was just like Judaism puts this huge, huge focus on eating kosher and all these like little details of your life yep. and how much God cares about that. And when uh, one of the big things for me was just I'm learning about this all powerful God, yet somehow He cares so much that I wait six hours after I eat a milk product. Sorry, after I eat a meat product to eat a milk product. I was like, what? yeah what this makes no sense like it's just not disparaging anyone who believes in that but for me it was just yeah that i, I can totally see that yeah um i wanted to go sorry on, sorry yeah, no please go continue. um how do you think that like this experience that you had growing up do you think that it impacted your current politics at all yeah i mean i i think it's impossible to have life experience that don't impact your politics to a certain degree mm -hmm. um but I think it's very complex as to how it did. Um, certainly, uh, it gave me an insight into indoctrination, um, which now I encourage all people of all political walks. But, you know, being that I mostly run in left circles, I encourage a lot of lefties to um, really come to understand how indoctrination actually functions and how people are indoctrinated into things, how uh, what it does to your mental state. Um, because people don't really get it very well. I think there's like I, one of the things that drives me nuts. I think you've probably seen these things on Twitter, but there's like these takes that are like, um, oh, like, you know, uh, f former ex like should be ashamed and then like you shouldn't talk, you know, they shouldn't talk to them, shouldn't be allowed in spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another, there's like the other thing of like the Michael Moore tweeting about like, ah, oh, fuck red states and all this shit like that. And like, they should die and not have COVID. And you know, you know, the memes, like the memes that are just like, yeah. oh, people are irredeemably bad if they've ever done anything wrong. And, um, I think that there's this sort of like conceptional un uh, for a lot of people that like our opinions are like, we like choose them. Like we're choosing products at a store like that you have a whole lot of control in them. But the reality is that while that's true for people who are liberated and educated, um, 
if that's you, a privilege in a, it in is a certain type of reality. privilege yeah it is being yeah. being able to have access to other uh, other worldviews is somewhat of a privilege and that doesn't mean that we don't discourage the bad behavior that we don't fight against it um but it does mean that like when you're looking at people who are still a part of those worldviews especially when it's especially when it's really super traditionalistic and it's really super dogmatic and religious people are people don't know they're those ideologies are designed in such a way that they encase your mind. And the thing that I always tell people about um, that I heard all the time in my church growing up, um, which people laugh because this is a line that's used in Warhammer 40K, because I think somebody from Warhammer 40K probably grew up in a church similar to mine, um, somebody who wrote <laughs> some of that. But um, they said that a, an open mind is like a fortress with the front door open. That's what they would say all the time. The idea is that you need to build a a, do, a a fortress of scripture and a fortress of religious practice and teachings around your mind, and you need to shut the gate because if you let things in, it will corrupt you. It will corrupt what you're thinking. So it's literally— It's one of the reasons why these communities are always so insular. Yes. Yeah, they are. And and th they work in weird ways, but the whole point is that once you're once you're into them, they start to slowly put those bricks together and they I insulate you using these thought a big part of it is like thought terminating cl cliches, um like discouraging critical thought and they literally wither those 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 that those parts of your mind over time so that you don't engage with critical ideas you could scream somebody could be screaming the the truth at you and it would bounce right off because you have a uh an like a like a shell around your brain of of religious faith and ideas and they bounce off and uh a lot of times once a crack gets in that person will eventually leave but the thing that they try to do is make sure there's never a crack ever well, this is why I like these this debate world so much. Like, even mm -hmm. though it can be toxic, it could be unhealthy for our mental health. Um, it can often lead to like the most unproductive conversations. Like we've all been there, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but the other side is even the worst of the worst still teaches you how to be critical, right? It still yeah. encourages you to be critical, and it's just such an important skill set to leading a healthy life. Yeah, and and I do think there are bit, there are like lots of fair critiques of the um of debate spaces. In fact, we're going to be going over one a bit later. Um I think there's a lot of fair critique of like the blood sportiness of of online debate. Mm -hmm. Um and I do agree that most of online debate is is primarily for entertainment and fun. Um but uh uh I do think that there's a lot of people who have those cracks in their ideology like shell that they might see a debate and it might widen that crack because they hear something that they've never heard before. Um, they hear a position they've never heard before. They're, they're, they're uh, allowed to, to think and chew on something that otherwise wouldn't have been in their mind. And so I do think there's value in debate for that. And that's part of the reason why I'm very pa passionate about it. In addition to me just having a lot of fun debating people. Um, I do think there's limitations and I, I, uh, tend to be pretty critical of of like speech like uh de like when people say they're like de-radicalizing people or whatever i don't really believe that like it's the it's the role of online people or radio people or whatever to de-radicalize i don't mm -hmm. think it really doesn't usually work however it what can be helpful and i know this from personal experience in addition to you know knowing a lot of other people then part of it's anecdotal but uh but uh is that is that once the cracks are there if you're one of those people who's like leaving or almost about to leave or you've just left or you're even left after a while but you haven't really found new things to think about and you're still sort of drifting with all these unfinished questions the debate spaces can actually do a lot for people like that to help them find a new place and 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 build better ideas for themselves that can lead them to be a lot a lot ha happier um and uh so i do think there's value in that uh i do think that people are a little bit too gung-ho sometimes saying oh yeah we're, we're like de-radicalizing people online in reality uh if if people are truly radicalized there is no nothing that an online person can do to put a, a crack in their in their shell most likely um there might be some random opportunities but in reality most of the time to get out of a to, to start the process of escaping indoctrination you need people in your life you need people who are emotionally close to you who can yep. be really patient and chip away very carefully and very gently and very lovingly um 
at that that shell that you build and i think that's true for cults i think that's true for QAnon. i think that's true for extreme conspiracy theory you the whole point is that they get you into a point where you are resistant to television you're resistant to they, they design it's designed that way and that is one thing i wish that a lot of people would learn it is something that i think is most influenced like do you know your original question was was about you know what parts of of life really influence my politics that's one of them um is is this idea that like indoctrination is super super dangerous to me and i think that um uh, especially like real indoctrination not just internet indoctrination i'm talking the type of indoctrination that uh that people experience when they're isolated into a church or into a uh a certain type of hyper insular culture. Um, I think a lot of times that like, for example, one type of indoctrination that a lot of people in America have that I think has led massively to our, um, to, to the situation we're in right now is like uh, Rush Limbaugh. And you might not think mm. it, but Rush Limbaugh was basically a radio preacher uh, for every single radio, every single area of the United States that's rural. Rush Limbaugh was basically the only entertaining show on the radio for two decades free to every single person pitched specifically to people who are bored listening at their job while they're farming while they're mowing their grass whatever and a lot of people would would tune into his show and hear the same i like ide ideas repeated with extreme emotion behind them with extreme intensity and severity and concern behind them and then they would be directed towards further extreme uh, uh, radio stations and 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 media, and it became insular for a lot of places. Because again, if you and everybody you know also listens to it, well, it's just like tuning into the preacher online. You know what I mean? Um, mm. So yeah, yeah. There's this is just like the problem in general with the internet, how people tend to retreat into their echo chambers. My answer yeah. to that, like a, a few years ago, when I first got into this debating world, I was primarily on Discord and the the purpose was to debate Nazis out of was to de-radicalize, right? To debate yeah. Nazis out of Holocaust denial. That was like always my initial goal. And I just had this idealistic concept because I never met Holocaust deniers in Canada because it's illegal here. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I was like, oh, like if I meet them, like, you know, and I just give them facts and logic, right? And evidence, like, you know, it, they'll, they'll change their mind. And it, it, sure, like some people did change their mind, particularly really young people, like teenage teenagers. Um, but the majority of them didn't um yeah. Yeah. and it also like i did it for a straight year and it got grating on my mental health because of course i couldn't tell them that i was jewish because if i said that i was jewish they're not going to believe a word out of my mouth yeah right? well, and, they'll, so, and they'll probably hurt you yeah. yeah so i at the time i was like i i, I was literally a crypto jew so um i had to <laughs> be quiet about that and that just like all of that this really started to grate on me mentally because you know it it just got exhausting and it's why like it's not up to people who are part of like an oppressed group to de-radicalize while yeah. it is a really nice thing um yeah it it does it puts so much pressure on you and i don't think anyone should feel like it's their job yeah right? absolutely and by the way there's massive there is massive jewish and trans solidarity uh and yeah. like and I, I i encourage that so much but i mean uh, and you say crypto Jew, like, I'm like, yeah, I've been crypto trans many times myself. Like that's, <laughs> yeah. that's so there is like a lot. No, of, yeah, it does totally intersect. Right. Because yeah, yeah. it really does. And, and I mean, of course, like even historically, uh, and I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to like go out to another topic, but I mean, for a while I was, I had a job where I wrote social media posts, uh, for, um, a synagogue or for a temple and, and, uh, and it was super awesome for me because like I found a lot of, and they were more progressive, not, not super orthodox. Um, but there was a lot of, uh, I felt very inspired by a lot of the stuff that I learned during that time because I was like, holy shit, like Jewish people in America have had a very similar treatment where there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, being I like sort of being isolated and and being left out of the rest of society of having to be secretive in certain circumstances of having um 
the normalization of like certain types of comedy and stereotypes of of you know having to look out for one another i mean like like historically if you look at the history of trans people in america like the 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 way like trans people build networks like quiet networks that nobody else even knows about that exist mm -hmm. that you just help each other because otherwise nobody gets nobody the discrimination is so much that you'll spend your whole life trying to find a job but if you fi have a friend who's trans who get manages to find a workplace that's trans friendly well then they can give all their friends jobs you know what i mean and it's like there's this whole thing of and again that's why i fight i i always say like the solidarity is so fucking important because there is a lot of shared history in that way um yeah and i feel like we ha yeah we have this unique experience because sometimes you can be visually jewish and sometimes you're not visually jewish mm -hmm. um and yeah it totally depends on multiple factors and sometimes people can also like minimize i've often felt um obviously i get anti-semitism from the right right and i'm yeah. sure you get transphobia from the right but i often Fuck feel well. like um, I get uh, some shit from the left where they kind of like diminish my experience as a Jewish person um, because of, I don't know, it, it kind of reminds me of how, you know, like there's like a turf narrative and just like, yeah, I would just warn you, this is a turf narrative if anyone yeah, yeah. feels uncomfortable with that. Um, there's a turf narrative that um, especially trans women who grew up presenting as i guess men uh -huh. um i don't know the right terminology of that i'm sorry if i if i use the wrong no, no, thing you're fine. but um but yeah presenting as men that they they've lived with this male privilege right and thus like don't know what it's like yeah. right and i like and I've, I've heard the exact same thing kind of subscribed to jews right like that mm -hmm. it's like you've lived your whole life sometimes especially with american jews i'm not american but mm -hmm. um you've lived your whole life like subscribed with a specific kind of privilege um and especially like you, you sometimes get passed as white and all this stuff right or yeah. like in that category but there's this entire internal world that's going on there um yeah. that you're always aware that you are other right yep. Absol and, oh 100%. yeah and that shit is very unique and and if you'd like i can actually talk about this a little bit because like i'm i'm, I'm perfectly oh, fine yeah, with talking sure. frankly on this subject because this is something that gets talked about a lot um and i know some people are really weird about talking about it and understandably so um but like the idea of like uh trans people having like male privilege or whatever um mm -hmm. like i pretty i've talked pretty frankly about my experiences before and after transition i mean i did a whole segment um a couple of weeks ago where i uh was i got off on some rant i was talking with chat and uh i started talking about my experience in sales and I have a sort of a unique experience, which is that I succeeded really well in sales pre-transition. And then I moved to a different location, transferred locations, transitioned full time, and then also succeeded in sales presenting as a woman. And it was a totally different experience. And I had to learn a completely mm -hmm. different way. I still did it, but it was super difficult. And so, um, but p another thing that people don't acknowledge ever is that like, um, People have, like, misogynists have a nose for finding people who don't quite fit. And I yep. didn't, I never really, I never really passed as as a, a guy. Like, yes, was I a guy when people have said, yeah, you're, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a guy, whatever. Before I transitioned, sure, of course, that visually. But uh, my entire life was rife with bullying. Uh, my own family uh, like there were like three different points in my life where there was like gay scares about me, even though yeah. I have never been attracted to men. Um, I've always been attracted to women still am. I mean, there are some men that I find attractive because whatever, you know what I mean? But I was like, never <laughs> yeah. like vi o openly. Um, and so, but, but nonetheless, there was this moment where I got interrogated my, by my dad, just out of nowhere. It's like, Oh, are you gay? And it's like, uh, no. And it's like, well, why are you doing this, that, and the other thing? And it's like, okay, uh, I don't know how to explain that to you. It's just like who I am and whatever. Um, and then there was another time where uh, some a friend like hijacked my Facebook and said like, I'm gay. You know what I mean? Like the kind of like bullshit high school people get up to. And mm -hmm. I literally didn't even notice until uh, because I was do we were doing shit, and I got a phone call from my dad who was in international waters because he was on a cruise at the time. So I was like, why the fuck is my dad calling me? He like, he's not supposed to, like, he never calls. It's expensive as fuck. And he paid all the extra to call me and interrogate me because he'd gotten an emergency call from my aunt who said it happened. It finally happened. 
and I was like, <laughs> like n no, no one yeah. else in my family got this treatment ever. No one did, uh, but I did. And it's, so it's like, is that like, is being constantly un like treated like that? Is that like male privilege? No, these people have a, have a nose for it. And I think that that's, and again, like, I don't know exactly because I'm not Jewish. I don't know how that compares exactly, but there was a certain resonance in you saying that like, there are times where you pass and there are other times where you don't, but you're always aware of the otherness. And I was yep. always aware of the otherness. If I can tell one other quick anecdote on this point, for I'll sure. give, it's, this is, I think, I think people will love to hear this one. So when I was like towards the end of high school, um, my church had this, uh, this book came out um, that was a sequel to a really, really well, or like a, a side quill to a really, really popular book that had been written by a Christian guy that had swept the nation in the past. The book was called The Captive Heart. And it was a, again, a side quill to this other book that was called Wild at Heart. And Wild at Heart was, was like the subtitle was like a man's, uh, the, the definitive man's guide to being a Christian man. And then Captive Heart was the definitive woman's guide to being a Christian woman. And I read the Captive Heart as it was, you know, p popularly spreading through the church. And I read the, or I read the, uh, the wild, wild at heart first. Um, and I had a serious, like multi-week, uh, bout of like severe depression. Um, because, Nothing in that book made any sense to me at all. But everybody else who I knew was like ranting and raving about how awesome it was. The, the pastors were talking about stuff about how this relevant the shit is. And I didn't feel like anything in there was even remotely close to my experience or how I viewed myself or what I thought about. And, yep. um, and then I read The Captive Heart and a lot of it did resonate with me. And... Again, I had no words to explain this. And so at the time, I kind of thought, well, maybe that, maybe I just have a unique insight. Maybe I'm just really good at understanding, you know, like women or something. And, uh, but again, like, <laughs> and then I, I, I stopped reading them all together because I was like, I like, this is causing me like mental dissonance. I need to focus on school. Like this is killing me yeah. right now. And like, literally, I mean, I can't even explain. I, I, I it was so painful, like to read that book and like to be panicking about like, Oh, I can't, I don't want to talk about this with anybody because I'm going to have very different answers than them. And I know that I am. Um, and that was one of, one of those such examples where I had no words to explain this whatsoever, but it was, it was like a painful amount of dissonance. Um, and, uh, yeah. So that's another, you know, example of that sort of thing where it's just like, uh, yeah, like there were things in my upbringing that like, uh, put me that like put me on a different very different path where it was like I knew there was I just knew I couldn't put words to it but I knew that I wasn't the same as everybody else and uh, yeah and you know that when people are talking about the privileges of men um, and all that stuff like you know there's probably a, a sense of feeling like you know that they're not really talking about you right yeah um, well I mean you yeah. don't because because like obviously it's to a slightly lesser degree because I mean uh, I, I do believe that like you can benefit from some certain types of uh, of of like male privilege when you pass as male before transition, uh, but they're very conditional. They're incredibly conditional, and if if anybody finds out that there's something up, it disappears like that, like instantly. Mm -hmm. um, like for for example, one such example is I that I do believe that like pre transition, I think I excelled to, to certain degrees at sales um, because uh, there is so much misogyny in the sales uh, industry that just even appearing to be male gave me an advantage. Even mm. though I was very different and there was a lot of shit that happened that was like, okay, but even that appearance makes you get treated different because most of the people that you're going to be talking with and working with, they never spent, they never actually get to know you. They never find out that you're kind of, you know, weird and sensitive and whatever, or whatever other things they never find that out because you're just talking to them and they see you when you're talking as a man. And then you are able to benefit from that. I, I talked about this in the, in the sales stream that I did in more depth, but like got like men, uh, like the average boomer man that you encounter working in a sales job that you're going to be talking to and trying to sell to 
they 100% believe and, and, um, reinforce the, the like guys club. They treat men so differently than they treat women. And that became unbelievably apparent after I transitioned because I couldn't sell the way that I used to. You go, you don't get to, t and I, what you was the first thing you noticed when uh, you transitioned? The first, like in terms of how the world treated you. Oh, oh, I mean, uh, the first, the very first thing was, um, was that you don't get to be an equal anymore. And that was very weird and very shocking. Um, because obviously I had felt like there were times where people, uh, like were trying to like, you know, you, when you get the feeling that you're being strong armed and like somebody really wants to feel like they're on top of you, you know, the customer service, like, mm -hmm. you know, but, uh, but never to the same degree. Um, you cannot, you cannot se sell presenting as a woman, uh, with, with confidence. You have to sell with de deference. It's very weird. Um, and you, I mean, you can have a certain form of confidence, but it has to be like confidence in deference. It's like, I, I did this, I did an exercise with my stream where I did my sales pitch, what that I would have given when I was, when I was outwardly seen as a guy and my sales pitch that I would make money with as a, as a, you know, when I was presenting as a woman and, and this was their, their, their worlds of different one is totally deferential and you have to, or they just won't buy from you. You just won't make money. So you have to do it. If you, if you just mm -hmm. stubbornly refuse, your numbers will suffer and then you lose your job. And so you I have to be I also feel like a lower threshold as well. Like in the debate world for what considered, what, when you're considered a quote unquote debate bro, like for, for me, like I got called a debate bro just when I, you know, questioned someone's belief, you know, yeah. and asked them some evidence. And I was like, whoa, I don't even feel like I'm being a debate bro, but I guess, I don't know, like. I have no clue, but I'm I'm assuming that maybe it had to deal with some of like some inherent like misogyny that they just weren't used to, you know, a woman act like talking like that. <laughs> oh, one hundred percent. Um, one of the experiences that like so yes, one hundred percent on that. Like, um, I noticed very early on in my uh career of streaming that any aggression at all or even standing up for yourself even in the slightest if you don't like sort of bow down and just take it on the head um then you will be called a bitch you will be called like a fucking you'll be so, like so annoying you'll be called overly aggressive like i'm like let's like again i'm an og vosh fan you know i remember old vosh like vosh is much 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 kinder to the people he debates these days vosh used to be a fucking mega debate bro super super come in super hot like he would start a conversation off by let's let's uh i, I just watched one the other day and he started the debate off he was like well i'm glad we can get the pleasantries out right now because i'm guessing that by the end of this conversation you're not going to feel very nice about me and that's how he started a conversation <laughs> with somebody he'd never talked to before if i ever did that I would be, I, well, I mean, I don't even need to do that. I, I just debate at all. And I am told that I'm the most bad faith, emotional, screeching, uh, I've been, everything, you just name it. Every single thing is like, ah, demon mama is the most obnoxious. She screeches. She's like super bad faith and it's just manipulative. And it's like, okay, you're just reciting stereotypes at this point. And it's I like, I also wonder like how much we women like further proof perpetuate these stereotypes ourselves right you know like that yeah. inter internalization of it like I know that when you and I first had that debate the whole time I was like oh like you're so smart you're so cool I'm so excited to get to debate you and then we disagreed on one thing and I felt like you just like straw man me and talked down to me and I was kind of hurt by it and uh when I really thought about it I'd gone and straw manned and um you know or talk down to you like a bunch right but for some reason it stood out to me when you did it and i think like there was like um it was probably like yeah some internalized misogyny of being like oh my god like you know the other the other woman in this conversation is doing is doing this to me yeah um, and 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 yeah. It, it does happen um another thing that's like sort of a, a little different that happens all the time um is uh, well, here's one that somebody from chat just brought up, uh, gay fresh from my chat says, uh, you, the, the thing that I hear most is like, people go, Oh, this, this person is just a clone of Vosh, but they like Vosh and they hate me for some reason. And it's like, how's that line up? But the other one that happens yeah. is, uh, like we had a meme for a while on the channel, uh, of, we had this, uh, in fact, I think we still have the command. There's a car, there's a, there was a command called bingo and it would bring up a it would be bring up a bingo card that would go to the things that most commonly got told 
like straight to my face. There it is. Yep, it's still there. The bingo card is still there. Um, of all the stuff that I would get told, and the one that was the the free space was you talk too much because no matter how much or how little I talked, I would always be told that I talked too much, and uh, that one happens all the time. And it it's like that's been studied. Like you could literally that's like my number one anxiety, like yeah. feeling like I'm going to talk too much in this instance, like, especially on those panels. Like I'm always thinking I, I need to make my intro as short as possible. I need to make my point as concise as possible because I just don't want to take up too much of the space. Yeah. Well, I mean, here's my advice. My one advice uh, to you is fucking pitch it out the window, take as much time as you want. And guess what? Just say Even fuck if you, <laughs> yeah. Say fuck it. Even if you do take too much time, who cares? So do the, do, the dudes do this fucking shit all the time. Like literally there will be panels where fuck people will, People who weren't even invited, dude, dude streamers who weren't even invited to the panel will crash a panel and take over the entire panel, talk for the entire panel, and no one else gets to talk, and no one will bat an eye. So I say, fuck it. Uh, I don't even care anymore. I, like, laugh when people say that shit at me now um, because I just realized that, like, if I don't elbow my way in and become, like, and, and embrace being, like, they're going to call me an obnoxious bitch if I say one word during the panel. So I might as well say 100 words and get my word out. So... Yeah. But yeah, we had, um, I don't know if you saw this, but I had like this debate with Destiny, Vosh, and um, Vivian, and just like a few people about, uh, you know, platforming, and uh, and most of the debate ended up being about like this list that I'd got, this like fascist list I'd accidentally been put on. Yeah. And even though like the debate's literally about an experience I've had, I think I got to talk like, I don't know, like a, an eighth of what everyone else got to talk about. It was just such as, and I, I kept being told, oh, you got to interrupt, you got to interrupt, you got to do it. But it's like, it was just so hard for me to teach myself to do that stuff. Yeah. Just, just remember that like, uh, you have the science on your side. Like you can actually, I, I can't even remember the name of the study, but, but if you look it up, if you look up, like, uh, there's a, there's a, there was a big study that was done about this, about how not only do men overestimate, um, how much women talk but they also underestimate how much they, they themselves talk so <laughs> they oh there's it's a double effect like women literally get a double whammy uh of of being of of seeming like in business settings and whatnot that that saying that being told that they talk too much and also the guys uh, underestimating how much they actually talk so it's like you get double whammy yeah the way that the best advice i have for other women in the twitch space is uh like just learn to fucking shove in mm -hmm. and um and you have to learn to elbow in you don't have to be super mean but you got to get you got to get your word in i i've even given panel hosts issues because i've been god there's been so many i could talk uh, i could talk all day about this but like it's it's bad and 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 it's pretty blatant if you go and 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 i mean obviously you spend time in the debate space you get to f you get a feel for it um but it's it's pretty slanted. I feel like you yeah. and I could complain about this for literally like twenty five hours. Straight. Probably could, yeah. I could tell a hundred stories. I have like uh, I have as many as many stories as I've been on panels, pretty much, with few exceptions. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, we um, keep doing it because yeah. it's 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 like addictive. I don't know. I mean, um, the thing is, I'm gonna go to the panel even if everybody says that I'm a stupid piece of shit, screaming banshee bitch. Like I don't care. At, I, you know, I've gotten to that point where I'm like, I'm How here. did you build up those calluses to be able to handle that shit? Um, I don't know entirely. <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, part of it is just practicing. It's a hard question. Um, but the other part is just like, uh, okay, so like, there is a little bit of truth in like having fun with being like, with being perceived as a villain. Um, I don't love being perceived as the spiciest uh most bad faith bitch on the internet but if i'm gonna be called that anyway may as well have a little bit of fun with it right um so you know uh i'll i'll do some things that other people won't do i'll be a little meaner than some people are willing than some other women are willing to be um i'll be a little more abrasive because they're gonna say that about me anyway so i may as well just let myself have that license uh that helps because you kind of know that you're like yeah um but the other thing too, here's another thing. You want to hear one of the ways, actually, I, I thought of one of the ways that I help that I get myself through mm. it, um, which is, uh, this is totally megalomaniacal. So I understand if, if people are going to take this and be like, wow, uh, this is the most megalomaniacal, but, but femmes out there, keep this in mind. Think about Oprah. Okay. Cause Oprah was like, uh, was like, I'm going to make a talk show for women on TV. And it was like, 
nah, it's not going to happen. Women don't watch talk shows. Oprah's a fucking billionaire now. You want to yeah. know why? Because there's a fuckload of, and I know this for a fact, by the way. I can't give you all the data, but if you if there's ever a gut a gut feeling that I would be willing to stake my life on, there are a fuckload of femme people out there who really want to see femme people kick ass. And it's a totally untapped market because nobody, except for me and a few other people, are uh, are make is making that type of content. Is to well, have you seen? Sorry. No, go ahead, please. Uh, have you seen Gone Girl? Uh, no, I don't think I have actually. Okay, you should really see it. Okay, but, I'll put on um, my master. The main, the main character is a villain. Like, sorry, the main female character is a villain. Okay, and yet she's like worshipped just by women everywhere, even yeah. though she's like this vile, terrible human being. Um, because she's like this personification of like female anger, you know. Yeah. Um. And even though, like, everyone knows it's so toxic and stuff, it was just so cool to see, like, a, a real female villain on screen yeah. that had, like, genuine reasons for, you know, being villainous. And there's just something fun about it, right? Yeah, and even I mean, I, it's I do bad. think, yeah, it is. But I mean, also, there's, like, this whole thing where, like, again, like, uh, the most evil uh, that I could be imaginably is going to be nothing compared to what, uh, like, fucking like like keemstar exists like this is a guy who just like bullies people for a living and people are like yeah bro yeah he's so badass it's just like come on like you got it there's a lot of room it's just you know the all bar the cancellations that have happened i don't get why that has never happened oh, of the because... shit that he has done yeah and he's just still totally chill i don't know he's like uncancelable i guess yeah i mean i i joke about being uncancelable because i don't give a shit but i mean the reality is that like i've been subjected to an absolute deluge of harassment for not mm -hmm. for i haven't even made it i've just started pushing like over 200 act like average viewers like i'm not even like to that level at like to any of the level like again oh, it's so ridiculous we did a again i could scream about like misogyny and sexism in 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 streaming spaces we did a fucking exercise i think there's one woman in the top 200 channels on twitch at all one one yep and and yet you hear people screeching about fucking titty streamers and 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 the SJWification and the progressive and it's forcing women all over the place. One in the top two hundred. It's like Yeah. The double standard is fucking unbelievable. But uh yeah, just remember that uh, as much as they screech and whine and will try to make your life hell, if you find a way to survive, there is a market for it. There's a fuckload of women out there who who would love to have a stream that they could watch where they could see themselves to some degree in the content creator. Because, yeah, uh, yeah because uh, in reality, a lot of... Uh, it's not that... It's not this idea that, like, like femme people or women can't, can't like... Uh, can't enjoy male streamers they absolutely can of course i'm not like again i'm not a, like some sort of gender essentialist but like let's be real like there is a value in seeing somebody like you like and a lot of people don't know that this is something that gets me about when i have arguments about like people who are like oh like representation like isn't that like super not important i'm like no like you don't know what it's like to go your entire life never seeing anybody mm -hmm. who looks like you who acts like you at all on any media ever and that is what it's like for a lot of people. That's what it's like for trans yeah, people. Yeah, because humans learn by reference. Like, yeah, that's just a human quality. Yep. And so, so how it is do you important. deal with that? How do you deal with that juxtaposition between? Because um, I know that I can get really sensitive, like yeah. especially when you're a member of a minority, like mm -hmm. whatever minority it is, and you're used to getting harassed for it and stuff. There's a tendency, and I think like this is a tendency just with anyone who is somewhat traumatized, right, to be uh -huh. uncharitable, um, because like that the first instinct is if someone gives you criticism is you know it's because I'm a woman or it's because I'm Jewish or it's because of yeah. something like that. Like how do you learn to separate that? from the actual legitimate criticism and not just let allow that to color all that criticism. I think that one is just a lot of analysis and a lot of experience because like, uh, there are a lot of people who just are coming at you based on identity. Um, there was, uh, again, there's a lot of people who will write comments on my posts that I'm just like, this is a double standard. You're, I know which fandom you're coming from, and I know what you're saying to me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, people who come in and they're like, 
the fans of like a massive debate bro and they come in and they're like oh, why are you so, so fucking argumentative you're so fucking bad faith you're always picking fights with people i'm like bro your fucking person literally crashes panels all the time to go cause shit like and you're gonna get mad at me like nah so you you get you start to catch those and just not engage with them because you know that it's like not worth giving them your time um yeah. but another thing is like unfortunately you uh like you have you do have to learn a certain amount of like unfair patience it's just true um mm -hmm. which is like and this is i think that this is even more true for me being trans than you know just being femme and 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 that and that's because like it's usually a little more explicit with being trans and you have to like and also it's it's it, it is the trans people are like the acceptable minority to hate these days. Like lots and lots of people get away with hating trans people or feeling weird or saying weird things about trans people. And it's not quite to that level where people can like, um, where it's like, you know, if you're openly racist, like you're going to get fucking shut down really hard in most cases. Mm -hmm. It's um, still seen as like a political stance, right? Yeah, yeah. Rather than a moral stance. Yeah, exactly. And so like, yeah, people think that it's like, oh, you're being polit you're yeah, it's like, oh, well, I just have different political opinions. It's like, well, you're saying that I'm like illegitimate as a person and that every that I'm like you're you're implying heavily that anyway. So, you have to like you have to learn to have a long fuse with these things. And the reason for that is that uh if you start to get the feeling like you're being um you're you're experiencing a transphobia um or whatever, uh, you let them bring you. You let them bring their rope out and let them hang themselves with it a little bit, or at least let them give you the rope with which you can hang them. Because uh, the problem is that with I don't believe in like complete self censorship or assimilation or anything. Because I'm I left sales. I don't do that anymore. But uh, will I endure a couple of free? Will I let them get a couple of free hits in so that it becomes apparent to the audience that I am holding back? while they're mm -hmm. doing something shitty shitty then yeah i will now uh and and i think that that's most apparent in my uh conversation my debate that i had with redneck um some people will know this some people will not but this guy is a a just raging like he doesn't acknowledge it at all but he's a raging transphobe and he got like he said like three or four just absolutely egregious things before i really went off on him but when i did the entire audience was on my side. And that's because by the time that we got to the third one, he'd used up, he'd used up even their willingness to recognize, you know, that, uh, that, you know, th their willingness to, to let things slide that they didn't really realize are, are as painful to, to, to me as, you know, less, less than, a, or, I, I'm fucking up my words, mm -hmm. but I think you get what I'm saying. Like if yeah. they see that they're like, a lot of random average your average audience cis people like they 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 don't see the transphobia until it's been like it's been dropped in their face and yeah i feel it because i know when somebody's making a fucking shitty comment i know when somebody's being passive aggressive but um if i think that somebody's really bad you give them their one or their two free passes and then that's it and then you whack, and you point it out so I want to ask you a random question. Sure. It's just like off the cuff. There is, um, I was talking with Alice, who's a, I think another trans woman you've spoken mm -hmm. to before. Um, and she mentioned, I suggested that like, to me, it seems when someone mis when someone misgenders, like I say, mm -hmm. a trans woman around you that, um, that I feel, I feel like I should speak up and be the one to be like, no, those are her pronouns. Right. Um, because I feel like it's probably really stressful and anxiety provoking for the person that is trans to, to say that themselves. But, um, Alice told me that's not always a good idea. So like, what, what is the right situation? What uh, is the right thing, I guess, for a cis, cis person to do in that situation? Yeah. I mean, I think like it, it's really super contextual, um, like, because it can depend on the person that you're hanging out with or whatever. Um, in general, like I will... I will defend myself. You know what I mean? Like, that's the way that I tend mm -hmm. to approach it, which is like, if somebody's like misgendering me, like really bad that, or something, then I, and like, I would, I generally like to be able to be the one to be like, Hey, can you fucking fix that and not have anybody else do it for me? Um, but if like, uh, but I think that changes sometimes for people who are like, um, uh, perhaps more, 
um, like more uh, shy or perhaps if they're a lot earlier on in transition, they may not feel like they're allowed to at all. And sometimes that can help. You kind of got to read the, read the situation. I will say though, it is helpful when, uh, when cis people speak up when the trans person isn't around. And if cis people mm -hmm. are willing to speak up when no one is, when seemingly no one is looking, um, that, in my opinion, that actually makes a lot of, that makes a lot of help because it means that like, uh, it starts to break down the idea that like, like cis people can just turn off their politeness when they're not, when they think they're yeah. not around anybody who's, so that's helpful. I, I think I would tend to agree with Alice in general on the first one where it's like, uh, you know, usually most trans people who are in those sorts of spaces are going to be able to to bring it out and they have a certain tolerance that they'll allow. Again, people fuck up pronouns all the time. I don't really freak out about it um, at all. Like, and I've gotten, I've gotten people going real bad on me. I've had whole chats just deliberately misgendering me just to try and piss me off. It doesn't work. Um, but, uh, but uh, yeah, usually I'll, if there's something that's annoying me on a panel, which I have spoken up before, I prefer to usually have my own agency over that. Um, but definitely, I would definitely say that, like, if you speak up for someone when they're not around and people are, like, misgendering or whatever, not only will that, like, help the audience, like, correct if they just had misconceptions, but also it shows, it shows, like, support when it shows support in a space, like, where otherwise there would have been none. So that's, like, actually mm -hmm. filling a vacuum, you know? I, I look at that as, like, being willing to, like, come down on like racist jokes when there's even if there's nobody around who would like be the victim of that because it stopped them propagating where you know a lot of times prejudice exists in these like cracks where they think nobody's looking you know it's the it's the mask wearing thing you know they put on their mask yeah and then exactly. when, when everybody's around they look every other way and they go hey, and then you make my you know jokes and it's just like coming down on that that pushes them that pushes those people like it pushes that behavior further into inappropriateness so i do think that's very helpful um so personally. i've heard that you said that you're non-binary as mm -hmm. well as a trans woman right mm -hmm. yep um and so a lot of people would probably find that confusing i guess who, who are not familiar with that kind of terminology yeah so um what does that mean like in your case yeah i can explain um actually i can explain my thought process um yeah uh, what that would honest. be amazing yeah so i started uh identifying as a non-binary trans woman after uh well, before i started streaming um like about two years ago and it was a very it was after a lot of thinking um because uh for a long time i considered myself a, you know a binary trans woman that i was gonna and and like i was like yeah i just want to be known as a woman and i still use she her pronouns um and uh i i tend to um you know i i like it when i'm referred to as a woman um but I also realized that, like, I don't like the idea of of being essentialized to that, uh, or 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 being like being stuck on this idea of a binary. Like, I think there's a uh, it's very weird, and it's it's kind of hard. And I understand why this would be confusing to a lot of people and and whatnot. But at the same time, there is certain expectations that are plate that are still placed on you even when you're a like when you're willing to tackle gender and transition and 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 like there's this thing that people have talked about you might have heard the term like butch phobia um mm -hmm. which is like like some people like again it's not talked about pretty heavily but it is something that it's exists like you can't and, be a butch trans woman right? yeah oh like that's the attitude it's yeah. it is that is a very very strong attitude in my opinion that is all over mm -hmm. the place and uh there was this part part point in time where i realized like you know i had uh you, you know i had uh, a a one of my gender confirming surgeries a couple of years ago um an orchiectomy um i'm very open about that uh and that was very good for me i don't really feel like i want any further bottom surgery or anything um and i'm you know at this point i've been I've known I was trans for 10 years. I've been solid on hormones consistently for six years. And it's like, um, there's, uh, there was this thing where I realized like, no, like I really, I, I identify strongly with, with, with femininity. And I like being seen that way. That is who I am. But at the same time, I acknowledge that like, there are still people who don't see, see me that way. And there are still people who, 
uh, want to put me in a box and who will judge me as supposedly less than because I'm trying to claim this. And there's also a part of me that recognizes that at the end of the day, there isn't a gender, bi there isn't a gender binary. And as mm -hmm. much as I like femininity, I would like that to be a characteristic or an aesthetic someday, as opposed to this box that you have to climb into, that you have to do all of these certain hoops to jump into. I think that anybody should be able to embrace that without, with or without transition as they see fit. And so I came to this realization that like, wait a second, like I don't really believe in this binary. And I, uh, so the, and, 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 and it just fit better for me to say, no, I'm a non-binary trans woman. Like I, I do gravitate very strongly towards certain feminine things but sometimes i want to do things that are not associated with that and i don't want anybody to feel like like to 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 ex to have weird expectations on me so it was it became it, it became it made sense to me to identify as a non-binary trans woman and oftentimes people will just ask me just because they've never encountered it before and then it leads to me being able to explain you know what i mean why why i feel that way and what i think about gender as a whole and why I fear like yeah. being put into a box. Um, and you know, there are times where I, uh, like to, uh, I like to express differently than, than, you know, a like what you would expect a binary person to express. Like, um, you know, I have a, a, a costume in the works. That's pretty, that's pretty work. It's going to be pretty mask leaning, you know what I mean? But, mm -hmm. but I don't, you know, I don't want like, I feel like I should be free to do that. You know what I mean? I feel like I should be I wonder free to like do that how many women yeah. I wonder how many women, like both cis women and trans women, like have felt um during this whole pandemic of working from home, of like starting to just break down all these habits that we've built up. Um, that we assumed that we just absolutely like naturally adored. I mean, I just for me, things like wearing heels and makeup and all these, you know, stereotypical feminine things, like how many of those things I've started to feel like, oh, that I don't think I really was doing that for me because I'm not doing it now. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and my feet feel so much better <laughs> um, and all these and my skin so much better and all these things. And like and then on top of that, trans women are questioned and all are always having like their femaleness questioned. So there's that added pressure of trying to be female enough to be accepted. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, it's. There's a, I've had the, the discussion about makeup, like one of the most, what a, what a great conversation I had on, on the, uh, primes, Amazon Lily podcast. There was, it was a couple of months ago and we had a conversation mm -hmm. about just this and about how I did used to wear, well, so I used to wear makeup when I was in sales, I wore makeup every single day and, um, and it was definitely out of fear. You know, because I felt like I didn't pass when I didn't wear makeup, when I didn't like I had to do a lot of makeup, like I had to do like a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then, you know, I, you know, started to like makeup in some ways and I still do in t to a certain degree. But there was this point in early streaming where I was doing makeup every stream and I realized that I was starting to stress out about it and I wasn't enjoying it. And so I stopped and I don't wear makeup now. Um, and I. Uh, there are some times where I still feel like a, a little weird about that because I'm like, uh, people like, do people think I'm gross or whatever? Um, but there's also a part of me that feels very free because, uh, I like wearing makeup when I want to wear it, not when I feel like I have to, because other people want me to. And, mm -hmm. um, there are some, I look back at times where I'm most proud of my makeup and they were times where I was, I chose to like do a fucking awesome look. And that was for me. And that is like so much of a better feeling than feeling pressured into it or feared into it. And I do think that like, I personally, I think there's going to be a lot of societal, like a lot of societal rethinking of certain things because of the par partially and thanks to the pandemic, a lot of people are spending a lot of time thinking on their own and, and challenging these things. And uh, for people who d didn't know it already, like there is a lot of, uh, coercive beauty standards that 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 women are are held to um yeah <laughs> it's ridiculous and and a lot of women don't like they 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 grow so strong they grow so strong you know what i mean like 
carrying them all the time that they don't even feel them that you might even ask some women mm. out on the street be like oh do you feel like you're pressured into wearing makeup it's like nah not really i just put my makeup on every day it's not a big that deal. is such a good analogy like as if it's like a weight that you're carrying and you just stop noticing yep it kind of is though in a lot of cases yep. i mean when i was in sales again i not only not only did i always wear makeup because partial you know that was mo like it's a double-bladed sword because it's like i want to pass a woman but i also want to look good as a woman and, and fit in with all the other women who are also wearing fuckloads of makeup at my job because I have to. Mm -hmm. Nobody in sales, no woman in sales ever doesn't wear makeup. It's just not a thing that happens. Um, but I also had to wear a very, very femme um, out, uh, uniform. Not not uniform, it's an outfit, but you have only a few options you can choose because they're trying to keep their branding consistent. And for women, it's a skirt uh, or the the most ugliest, uncomfortable pants that you could possibly do uh and that you could possibly wear and a little like green ascot that you have to wear and uh i thought i looked good at times but i also realized that like wow like i don't really have a whole lot of options here i kind of got to wear this like this skirt always and like i don't really that's not really my style i'm way more like like i've come to find out that my style is way more like soft butch like i like wearing like tank tops and and uh and, and fucking jeans or or uh you know like plaid shit and and like you know uh ripped up fucking pants that i've gone camping in and whatever like that's way more my style and i'm way more comfortable and at home with that and like it is a weight it is a weight it's like you don't always see it as a as a weight but and I think a lot of people just, they grow so used to it that you don't see that it's like something that you're doing somewhat coercively, that you don't actually have that much of a say in. And I think it's freeing to be able to step out of that. Um, I actually I think you're so brave, like to do that. Um, yeah, because I know like the added pressure of being trans and everything can make you want to just fit this typical box of femininity in order to tell people that you're valid, um, yeah. which is such a sad thing. And I just, I don't know, I think it's super cool. Yeah, well, thank you. And I mean, I I'm hap I'm much happier for it at the end of the day. Now, I recognize there's that in some ways there are there are factors and 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 uh what's the word? circumstances of my life that allow me to to I mean, I'm a streamer. I I stay in my house most of the time. <laughs> but like <laughs> uh, and, but like wouldn't it be cool if everyone could have if we could live in a society where everyone can have that sort of um agency over their own appearance and their styles and also i bet people would come up with some fucking really cool looking styles that haven't even been explored yet because we just are so weird about it here um specifically yeah, with we're women. so caged yeah. in we're so caged in yeah and it's it's it, femininity is like this weird it is like the prickly zone you know especially in america like men are not like men are not allowed to approach femininity at all makeup is not acceptable for men um like in some in some ways men are even more in a box at least visually yeah right, with how they can present oh yeah in fact i talked about this the other night about how um i do think that like uh visually like when it comes to like style like dress style and whatnot men are more trapped um mm -hmm. than 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 women are because it for a man to uh to like reach in and and grab uh something that's traditionally seen as feminine um it is like you are becoming gay it's like the way our society looks at it and it's like you are less of a man for doing that um whereas you know stylistically um some people are like p particularly religious people are very weird about women like wearing pants and and wearing men's clothes quote mm. unquote but most people are kind of like ah yeah good for her she's a go-getter or whatever and it's like oh okay so because you're becoming more like a guy you're you're or, or more masculine like oh you know you'll still get called a dyke because you know sorry i didn't mean to drop a slur but but you'll still get called that you know what i mean by people um but uh but but you'll also there's a little bit of respect that you get for being like ah oh, yes look at your you're going to your job and whatever um and uh and uh <sighs> yeah and then, then and then but i will say that when it comes to uh when it comes to things like career when it comes to things like field of study when it comes to things like role uh like in the family women are totally caged in and it is ridiculous to the degree that 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 happens and it's like i think that a lot of guys can't even understand that at all 
like he brought up the homophobia he brought up like the gay thing a bit and i wonder like how much do you think transphobe like transphobia is actually in part caused by an underlying homophobia right especially when it comes to trans women i mean i i i think there's a lot i think a lot of it is it smears together because our society again doesn't have the words for most of these things so like a lot of people Mm -hmm. live their lives until very recently when like a lot of trans stuff has been pushed to the public eye um like people just kind of assumed that that trans people didn't really exist and in fact this was even baked into um uh you know some of the the original diet like really problematic and and fucked up diet ways that they diagnose trans people um that like uh which is the whole like blanchard's uh dichotomy and all that shit um very very fucked up uh it's pseudoscientific bullshit that somehow made its way into clinics and stuff um but uh yeah there is definitely it definitely smears together because um people don't especially in america and and i guess north america i imagine this is the case somewhat in in canada as well there's not really like a they don't really separate sex and gender. And so as a result, it's like, oh, well, why would you do feminine things? Well, it's because you want to, like, bang a guy? Like, oh, you're gay. Like, it's so mm-hmm. fucking weird. And so, yes, I do think that there is a lot of that. I don't even... But I think the bigger thing that I would focus on is that it's often just disgust. It's not even necessarily... You don't even need to call it homophobia or transphobia. It's just this sort of uh, ingrained disgust that people have. It's and such a sad word, right? Like, sad. I know why you're yeah. using it, but... Yeah, it's just it's such an intense word. Yeah, but and and it, yeah. it it is what it is. I mean, uh, like, I have letters in my closet uh, that I've kept for to remember, like that were written to me by family members, and that is the only way to describe them. It's just they are disgusted at the idea that I might be trans. They are disgusted at the idea that I might not be, uh, you know, the, the 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 type of child that they thought I was, uh, that they wanted me to be. And it is it is a deeply rooted disgust, and um, you know this is something that you see. Um, if we get really deep into like talking about you know trans issues, you start to see this even being replicated in things like um, in like porn and stuff. That uh, mm-hmm. there is a it's really fucked. If you look into like a lot of like, and thankfully it's starting to change a little bit because people are challenging this. But for a long time, um, there was an implicit. Uh, humiliation that is tied to like most trans like scenes that are written for trans people specifically trans women in porn that like it's supposed there's like a, it, it it's inherent to the scenes it's like you're being humiliated and and it's disgusting and that's getting you off and it was like tied together it's so fucked it's so fucked and it's so subtle it's so upsetting too because so many trans people are also dealing with gender dysphoria mm-hmm. right yep so they're dealing with their own sense of that word yeah. and then on top of that they have to deal with it from the uh, the rest of the world yep. it's just so fucking cruel it is and and i i will say that like that is probably my i don't want to say primary but it's one of my most one of my biggest motivations in all of this that i do which is that i really really would by the time i die Whenever that happens, I want, I really hope that the world is a better place for trans people because, um, it's, it's fucking horrible right now. And, uh, and it makes me sad. And, and I had this, I don't know, there's been this thing that's been in my mind and maybe it's my, maybe it's a new fire for me or something like that. that's burning, but it's just like, uh, I'm so tired of all the trans people that I know in my life suffering. I'm so fucking tired of it. I'm so fucking tired of them being disrespected, disrespected. Mm-hmm. I'm so tired of them not being able to pay their bills because they they get passed over for things at work or they don't get jobs at all. And 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 everyone tells them it's something they're doing wrong when it's just like, no, nah, it's just really weird that they have all these credentials. They did all this good shit. They're really fucking good at what they do and they just don't get the jobs. They just don't get the raises. I am so motherfucking tired of it. I I I am so tired of thinking about all the trans people I know and going, okay, here's everybody who's really hurting i and that's why you'll hear me say people have people will sometimes come on and say you know trans rights and i always reply pointing at the camera and trans thriving and the reason why is because i think we need to go beyond trans rights we need to go to a place where trans people can thrive because uh 
I I don't want like trans people are are amazing and and there's been so many fucking incredible influential trans people that nobody even knows about or doesn't know that they're trans and uh and it just gets brushed under the rug and forgotten and it's like no like like people like me have done a lot of really cool things and we get villainized in public media all the time and I'm tired of that and I hope that I don't know I don't know that I'll be able to do anything I'm just a fucking streamer at the end of the no, day but I, I wonder hope so. like so tie it back but i wonder if this is particularly and you can tell me if i'm wrong mm. but why the whole situation with rgr was so painful for both of you right yeah that that it's like there's so much at stake here and you both probably really know this you know this in your own lives you know this in the people around you and it's just naturally gonna, there's gonna naturally be friction on how to deal with this right and the yeah. best ways to go about it Real quick, do you mind if I uh, hit the restroom real quick before I answer this question? Because I think I have a lot of stuff I want to say, but I want to yes, use the restroom. Yes, right. I'll be right back. Chat, uh, ask questions or whatever. <laughs> Try to look at your chat so I can answer both, but your chat's way busier than mine. So it's a little overwhelming. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how people can see that chat. That's crazy. Um, by the way, if you guys are, you know, I'll, I'll plug myself a little, um, if you want to hear more of like these talks, I don't know. I love connecting with people and talking about, um, I don't know, the really deeper stuff. So, uh, if you are interested in more of that content, you should definitely, um, sub to me on Twitch. It's aristocracy TV and you should, uh, follow me on Twitter, which is also aristocracy TV. So my uh, my twitter is a little less um wholesome it's uh, i can get yeah i can get mad sometimes there i'm not gonna lie <laughs> do you think there should be some women that come out and say i just got my account agreed now oh, is my chat just debating like 2012 feminism is that is that what's going on Yes, I got beat. Story of my life. Ever everyone's Twitter's no Twitter brings out it's like it's like the game Rust. I don't know if you've ever played that. It just brings out the worst in your character. Also, like why it's fun, it's terrible. When you said no question is off the table, did you mean to make this seem like a hardball interview? No, 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 that's not what I meant. Um, I just meant that we are gonna get into really personal stuff. I actually, I was supposed to do a content warning beforehand, um, but luckily we didn't really get into anything that was too crazy. Um, yeah, I didn't uh, I didn't mean that it was a hardball interview. That's, that's just like not my style. The thing is, Demon Mama gets, all the people that I bring on are constantly in these debates regularly, so they're constantly dealing with hardball interviews. So I don't, particularly feel the need to be hypercritical i'm demon mama gets that all the time and you can hear you can look up videos of that shit right um i don't know i for me i want to just highlight the people behind these political opinions the people who are actually debating and what you know makes us so passionate and everything back <laughs> Oh, Sorry welcome about that. back. My partner got me yeah. a cookie as well, <laughs> which is nice. Um, so. I want a cookie. <laughs> this, <laughs> yeah, I was good. It's a peanut butter cookie. I'm like, hell yeah. Um, so yeah, the RGR situation, high stakes and being a big personal issue. Absolutely. 100%. And I know it was for me. I know it was for her. Um, I don't agree with the way that she decided to go about the things, especially after the debate, but I understand why it got spicy. And for the record, like, like I was willing, I was totally willing to, after the first day, like whatever, I would have had another, you know, private conversation, anything like I was pretty willing to do a lot of different things. Um, but, um, I just don't, I don't know that that was mutual but as far as the first conversation i absolutely understand like why both of us got heated and i realized that like I, there were things i said that i like shouldn't have um and i really should have ended it because that probably would have saved us both a lot of pain um and i know that she is you know very very serious about the things that she wants to do and the things that she fights for um and i don't even know that like we had a really minor disagreement um as far as the bigger picture is concerned like 
our prescriptions at the end of the day are more or less the same. We had a small philosophical disagreement. Um, and yeah. You're and both it's fighting at the end of the day. You're both fighting for trans lives, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and that yeah. can matter more than anything else. Yeah. And, and I, I, I wish that it would have been resolvable. It doesn't seem like it was. And again, most of that was because of the aftermath, the way the aftermath was handled. Um, but you know, I don't know if there's anything I can do about that. I mean, I literally can't, uh, at least, you know, from my end, I've been blocked all over the place. Nothing I could even do if, not, even if I wanted to. And oh, so there... you guys haven't spoken or anything since nope. then? Um, nope. Even though, I mean, I've, I've expressed that I would be open to such a thing, but, um, I don't think that, um, I don't think that it's in the cards. Um, and again, there are a lot of things that transpired after the initial debate that I feel are, um, indicative of, uh, malintent, um, that perhaps wasn't, that I don't think was present in the original conversation, but that came out afterwards. Um, for example, um, like, like literally it wasn't just fans of people that were alleging that I was a transphobe. It was riley herself which i think is a completely ridiculous and uncharitable claim um i never claimed anything like that about her i uh, do i disagreed with certain parts of her argument but i don't think that that made her a bad representative for trans people or a transphobe but that is not that level of like uh approach has not been mutual so unfortunately i don't i just don't think it's in the cards maybe maybe but there maybe would she have to... just needs some time, right? Um... Maybe, but I mean, at the same time, like, and this is one area where I, I will, uh, like, I do tend to want to set the record straight because um, after, and a lot of people don't know this, but after the original debate, again, I ceasefired. Like, I was like, I, I sat down with my mod team. We were like, we're going to make sure that none of this, like, that there's no fucking harassment, that there's nothing. We're going to come down really hard on it. We're not posting the VOD. We're not going to cut the VOD and do a video. Um, my, uh, we were like, we're not posting this shit anywhere. This was a really super personal fight, and it was really messy for both of us. Um, and we didn't really go anywhere. It just kind of hurt everyone's feelings. Um, and literally the next day... Um, there were, well, from starting on Tuesday and going forward after the debate, Riley did numer multiple streams about me um, with a bunch of people who disliked me, um, said a whole bunch of, of what I believe to be genuinely abhorrent things about me while being encouraged by a massive platform um, and has proceeded to continue to um, fan the flames of those things. Also looked aside when member when people who she was talking with and platforming and communicating with um were repeating things like um like whether i was a transphobe or not. someone literally asked her on her stream do you think demon mama is a transphobe i have the clip of her literally being like uh yeah i think demon mama is a transphobe um and she like was yeah like people in my chat are like i mean she she banned people who were just just for being members of my community like a real like br bridge burning moment and this continued uh, until I made my response, which I had hoped like I wouldn't have to do at all, but I obviously needed to address it to some degree. That response was bombarded with harassment, um, which none of which was ever like I'm sure that was really hurtful to you too, right? Because yeah, you've, you've had to deal with so much transphobia and like that. It, it's so hurtful for me. Like um, people often when they find out that I was born in Israel, they 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 think, oh, she must be a Zionist, then she must be a Nazi. <laughs> Like that's yeah. like a lot of that's common shit I get from the left. And there is like nothing that's more hurtful than being grouped with the people who've oppressed you. Well, and and the other thing, too, is that a lot of these I mean, again, the allegations are just so ridiculous. Um, Like the idea that I'm transphobic wasn't even based on my argument. It was a a complete mischaracterization of a single line that I said. Um, and people literally, I was arguing just out of curiosity. Sometimes I like to push back with some people who have particularly egregious claims. And, um, I asked them to, to, they, they quoted back to me what they think I said. And then I showed them the actual clip and I'm like, do you realize that you were literally misquoting me? You put quotes around it, but you literally misquoted me in a way that made it favorable to your image and your, your argument. And that is not what I was saying. And nobody even tried. And it was this idea that like I was apparently invalidating her transness by saying like, I feel like this conversation um, has become like about justifying ex the existence as a trans person. Like, I don't feel like anybody has to do that. I feel like everyone's valid regardless. Like we don't have to 
argue to prove that we're good enough or that we deserve rights. We deserve rights be by the fact that we're human and we exist. Um, and that's why it was such a sensitive topic. And even though mm -hmm. I, as people in my chat are saying uh, that the exchange was bad for the trans community, and I can totally see that. But on the other side, um, there, I do think that there was like an added benefit of seeing the diversity in the yeah. trans community um, and seeing the diversity of opinion and that, um, you know, you all are not like just one monolith group and yeah. you are thinkers and thinking about the ideology behind it too. Um, and I don't know, I, th I feel like there was also a benefit to that. Um, so maybe that's the silver lining, even though I know it was Well, it's super funny too that you. people say that like, people will say like this whole thing was bad to the trans community. And, and to be fair, um, just by sheer numbers, like by a long shot, most of that is directed at me, not at RGR. And, um, and I think that's very unfair because uh, there's two things to, to think about that. One, I do think that it was a really messy conversation, but I didn't publish the video. RGR went forward with that, even though mm -hmm. there was our emissaries and everything, everybody who we had set up, that structure that we had set up for partnership, we were like, a t even separate from me, everyone was, there was unanimity across her mod team and my mod team that we shouldn't post this. We shouldn't make this into some sort of drama farm. We should just unlist the VOD, let it die as a personal disagreement and not let it become some giant political issue that a bunch of people went on to. But RGR launched the video immediately afterwards, immediately went on to a bunch of other people's shows to talk up to shit, to sh talk shit about me. Like I get that maybe some people might think that like, it was bad for the trans community. Well, I did my best. That was not me. And RGR was the one who put that debate in front of hundreds of thousands of people. So if that was bad for the trans community, you should take that to RGR. <laughs> not really. Don't do that. That's it's fucking a month ago. But you know what I mean? If, uh, well, that's, speaking that's, of, yeah. um, have, so we both know you're probably going to deal with tons of transphobia on the right. Mm -hmm. um, but what about the left like do you um how what kind of transphobia um have you dealt with from them um so there is it depends on how broadly you define the left right like yeah um i would say that there are a lot of, I, i'll say very broad yeah okay if we're gonna go really broad and say like the general american left uh there are a lot of transphobic liberals i'll just be completely honest about that um, mm -hmm. there are a lot of transphobic liberals and, uh, they don't, they are often sometimes, well, I don't know. They pull some of the same stuff where they refuse to acknowledge that they're doing it or care. And then they just dunk on you. I mean, like, again, like when I've crossed multiple, like heavily liberal communities, um, there I've gotten deluges of, 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 um, transphobia. And it's often um, weirdly intellectualized in like a way that um, the right doesn't, where the right is just like it's against nature, you know what I mean, that kind of thing. Um, but on the lib on the lib left, it's more like it'll be more like, no, this person is the wrong type of trans person, and they're doing harm to trans people by not doing mm -hmm. what I want them to do, which I think is both condescending, it's it's smug, condescending, and uh, transphobic. Um, and and they'll highlight certain trans people as like one of the good ones. Yeah, yeah. Well, absolutely. That absolutely happens. And uh, and another thing that can happen is uh, there is this very s subtle form of transphobia on the left um, that uh, I think is incredibly dangerous and bad, um, which is that. OK, so there's two parts of this. The first one is like uh, a the there is a, in my opinion, transphobic rooted expectation placed on all trans people that they be perfect before they step before they're allowed uh, before they step into the public eye and forever after they step in the public eye you're not allowed to make a mistake because you haven't just made a mistake or you haven't fucked up or you haven't just i 100 percent agree with you here yes like and, i wish people talked about that more well i try to i i talk i've done a couple of streams on this but a lot of people don't because a lot of times it just gets you for more people mad at you but this happens with uh, i think the best example is of course contra points uh like of somebody who uh has grown to a, a a decent level of fame um i think that people don't even have perspective on her fame she's very she's probably like the most famous trans person online um but she's not even close in fame to a lot of celebrities um but regardless of that yeah i love contrapoints too i i i literally like 
when I was like, she started making videos before she even knew she was trans. And I was watching them when I was just coming out as, tra when I was just going full time as trans. So it was really, really fucking Im Im important. Well, she helped change my mind on so many things. Yeah. There was, I grew up as like a huge Harry Potter fan, mm -hmm. loving J.K. Rowling. And I remember watching, and I remember like seeing the criticism of J.K. Rowling and I just didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I watched her video, because her video is really, it's not for people who already agree with her. It's right. really for people, it's really to change people's minds. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's just like the way she, because she never, she never straw mans the opposing argument. She just yeah. demonstrates why, why it's false in a very like honest way. And that's like, that's how you change someone's mind. Um, yeah. And yeah. I think, I think ContraPoints is particularly good at that. And I think that a lot of people don't give her the credit that she deserves for how well she's able to uh convince people uh like convince people who aren't necessarily far right or anything like that but people who are like perhaps in the liberal area or the slightly conservative area into reconsidering certain positions i think she's very very good at that especially so. turfs i think she has changed a lot of turf minds right i have always so. said that there's like yeah there's two types of turfs like in my opinion you could disagree right yeah. there's like the type of turf that isn't really even a radical feminist, right? Mm -hmm. They're just like a transphobe and they're a female. Yeah. And yeah. so, and then they join, they join the, the turf groups, right? Yeah. And then they call themselves gender critical. Um, but, and then there's the other type, which I, I see as more like uh, a radical feminist that is traumatized by their experiences. Yeah. Um, and they are just, you know, ignorant, right? And that doesn't necessarily mean that they're a bad person, but they're just ignorant of those views. Yeah. And those people, 100%, I've seen she like her change those people's minds. Yeah, I think um, I think you're so. you're broadly right. I would argue there's probably a third type of turf. Um but but yeah. Uh That's radical feminist and a transphobe. Um I think there's like the the third type of turf is a uh deeply self-hating um uh these people populate the gender critical subreddits heavily they're deeply mm. self-hating uh trans men um who are either like not they're 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 refusing that they're a trans man or they detransition because it was really hard for them for whatever reason and they've turned it into like mm -hmm. making it they're, they're, it's 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 huge there's a lot of people like a like political that. movement yeah it's like well i mean it's just like it's it's tempting right because i mean like i mean i know that there were a lot of um there was a uh, this is going to be really weird and really into the nitty-gritty of like inter-community politics but i mean for for a long time there was a like a sect or or a, a faction of trans women online who were super super all about like i mean now we call them trans medicalists but they didn't really have a name before and these were trans people who were very much um they were super apologetic for the 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 medical approach um there were right types of trans people and wrong types of trans people and mm -hmm. there i think that turfism and 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 gender critical quote unquote is like that but for trans men where um if you are having issues with gender and uh and 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 you but you can't quite get there because society fucking sucks but acknowledging that society sucks is a really hard thing to acknowledge so instead you can kind of just be like no it's the trans identity it's the trans uh you know there's all these like weird bad trans people that are like doing all this stuff the political trans people the trans i have a problem with the gender ideology and you'll hear that a lot in these spaces that mm -hmm. they talk about i don't have a problem with trans people i have a problem with trans ideology and there's a lot of those people who are themselves trans but deeply self-hating and deeply in denial. And I do believe that there's a lot of people like that out there. I, th I would say that's like the third type. Um, but, Is there a part of but, you that wants to be compassionate to those people um, because they're dealing with those self-hate issues? Yeah, uh, uh, for sure. Um, like, uh, and to, to varying degrees, there are certain people that I, uh, that I am less willing to grant like that emotional space to, but for sure. Um, like Blair White, it's it's. I think it's almost impossible for a trans person to look at Blair White and not feel at least a little sad, um, mm -hmm. because uh, and and maybe that's super judgmental, but I don't really care. Like she's been really horrible to other people, like really bad. Like I don't think this is even close to how mean she is to other people, but um, it does make me sad because it's like I mean, there were all when I was super super 
baby trans. Like there was a lot of stuff. There were a lot of bad ideas I had. Like, oh, fuck. I mean, I I literally, and I've talked about this on stream before. There was a point where I threw my hormones away because I was suffering so much the repercussions yeah. of trying to transition that I had this moment where I just broke and I was like, I can't do this. Like I've got to be wrong. I have to be wrong. Everyone is telling me I'm wrong. I have to be wrong. And it was horrible. It was agonizing. And it took me finally reaching a point where like, uh, I, I basically gave myself like exposure therapy to extreme, to extremely the most like transphobic, trans medicalist positions that I could possibly imagine and I just said no I'm gonna get to the bottom of this is any of this actually legitimate what's going on it was really super painful for me to go through and learn all these things and then go but but at the end I was like I don't have to hate myself anymore because these people are full of shit but I had to put myself yeah. through a lot to get there and it was a, there was so much self-hate like the the it dub that part definitely had ties into re into my religious upbringing because you learn to think about the world in terms of guilt. Um, and so for me, mm -hmm. I was, I felt so guilty and I felt like I was not trans enough and that I was, I'm, I, there was all always this worry that I'm like, Oh, am I deluded? Am I like whatever? Um, and yeah, so I, so the, the short, the, the, to get the answer to the question, yes, I do feel bad for a lot of people. I, I can sympathize, I can sympathize and empathize very much with the feelings of self hate. And uh, I, uh, yeah. when I saw when I saw that um, debate that she did recently with those conservatives and I like it, it the level of tra I hadn't seen like that kind of level of transphobia in a while that yeah. she had to deal with. And um, yeah, I guess I was in a bit of a in a bit of a bubble. And yeah. when I was watching it, I know she says like she's done bad things to people and stuff, but like, oh, my God, it almost made me tear up. Like, just, yeah. like, watching the shit, especially, like, everyone was raging at her for not defending herself, and, um, and I just, I, I just remembered all the times that I haven't defended myself, like, against, um, in those environments, especially when you're, when you're in a minority and you're trying to find acceptance, and it's so easy to just fall into this habit of, you know, trying to conform at least to something mm -hmm. just as a survival mechanism, right? Yeah, for like, sure. I mean, yeah. I, I couldn't think of how many times I've done things like I'm also I'm a quarter Asian. So like I used to have this huge insecurity about my eye size yeah. um, and the way my eyes were. So I like I once taped my eyes every single day um, in order to change the like make my eyelids more, you know, like European. Yeah. yeah. Um, And like, I don't know, there's just so many moments like that. And I, and I feel like she probably gets so defensive because of how she gets treated by by the left. But I just couldn't help but just feel some compassion for like the fact that she was in that situation and how much pain that yeah, probably I mean it is it is tragic. And yeah. and that is the thing. It is it is tragic because um it it's it is one of those things where it's like reaping what you sow. Like uh, I remember the first, my first encounter with Blair White, um, you know, online, this was before I was a streamer. This was before I was even interested. I mean, I followed, I was, I've always been interested in politics, but I didn't really follow online politics trends, but there was this one trans mm -hmm. woman that I followed, uh, who, you know, wrote a lot of papers. Like she's a scientist. She wrote a lot of papers like about trans stuff to try and help people understand it better and, and whatever. And Blair was like fighting with this person and i remember seeing this blair white person and going like what the fuck and then i scrolled their timeline and i saw her using like trans transphobic slurs uh against this other person who i really liked and i was like what the fuck and i was just like holy shit and it's like oh she's been dishing this shit out for a long time and like it's catching up you know she has succeeded at helping to build the world that will reject her. And that is very sad to think about. Um, and it's almost like, uh, it's almost Im impossible to separate the anger from the sadness because it's like, you're, I'm so fucking pissed that Blair White has spent years uh, cultivating a massive audience, churning out stuff that I have to now fight every single day, um, that all other trans people have to deal with every single day. But at the same time, it's also like she built her own trap, like she built her own death pit. And it's like, oh, my God, that's just so it, it is sad. It is sad. But at the same time, I'm also like I, I recently did a really spicy TikTok about Blair White. And I was like, 
uh, Blair White helped build the world that makes so many of my trans siblings homeless. And you're and she's going to be with us soon. You know, like it's very obvious by that interview that that the right is moving a, a direction in which she is no longer relevant. She is no longer needed for what they want. Um, and it is very sad. I don't know if she'll ever realize it. I don't know if she's capable of it. I don't know if she's too far in, but it does make me sad. It makes me sad that like, it, it makes me sad that that's the state of the world, that like it, somehow we've found ourselves in a world where for some, for many people, that sort of defensive hate and that sort of deference to cis people just because they're cis and just because they're the dominant members of society is 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 like a, a quote-unquote viable option for survival and um it's it is it's it's very sad yeah it just reminds me of like how much jewish culture and jewish history is being lost with jews focusing so much on trying to be these like model minorities yeah um yeah. and uh and trying to fit in with i guess like a uh, non-jewish society um and yeah, it's 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 a hard question because like what happens if I guess capitulating in some ways and being more pragmatic does lead to say like um, more medical treatment for trans people yeah. and like laws or something, but at the same time it's still perpetuating problems. Yeah, like I often feel like there's often there's just not a right way, a completely right way to go about this. Yeah, and I agree with you. Uh, it's really it's really super interesting that you touch on this again because again it's one of those parallels that i think there are like striking parallels between the experience of specifically in america jewish people and and trans people um in that like there is a uh a sort of cycle um of discussing assimilationism and in fact it's been it's been talked about a lot in trans circles recently the idea mm. of like well okay like do we really get meaningful wins when we do when we fight for like this sort of assimilationist approach where you clean where you clean up and you look super good like everybody expects and then you get like you know some people will point to things like gay marriage and it's like well gay marriage is like we're super happy to have that but it wasn't exactly what people were actually fighting about you know it's 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 great and it's super good but like gay the gay the the, the fight for for gay rights in america like was mostly about being fucking decimated by aids and having the federal government literally cover up and 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 lead to like deliberately uh hide information about it which led to so many gay people dying and 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 it's destroyed oh god like i it's hard sometimes to even talk about how the trans and gay communities have been destroyed by AIDS. And I mean, when when you mention things like losing bits yeah. of history, it's literal. I, I, fuck, I have... No, I had a gay man to, told me once that you don't understand, okay? During the 80s, we, it, we experienced a Holocaust. Yes. Right? No. Like, there was entire communities, friend groups, like, where it's like they're just gone, gone. wiped out. Yep. Yeah. And uh, there is this... There is a a friend of mine who I'll keep anonymous who is an older gay man and we have had these incredible conversations because he gets it he gets the pain when I say like I'm tired of my friends suffering like it's like he gets it and I can see and I could feel that he gets it you know what I mean because there's a lot of there's a lot of gay men who lived through the AIDS crisis who are alone now totally alone None of the people that they knew who was their friends group, who they survived with, who they shared laughter with are alive anymore. Mm -hmm. And yeah, now we have some stuff. We have stuff that can help you live with it, but it's, it's so little, so late. And, uh, and a lot of trans people, trans people, uh, traditionally are one of the highest still to this day are one of the highest groups afflicted with, um, HIV for a lot of reasons. And interesting. people never talk about that, right? Nobody, yeah, no when one it talks comes about to it. trans issues. And believe it or not, here's another thing that a lot of people don't know. This is a random little factoid, another parallel. Um, the have you ever? I'm, I'm sure you have. I'm sure you're familiar with this. I'm sure you've seen the picture of the uh, like in from the from Germany of the children throwing books into the fire, right? 
Mm -hmm. um, that famous picture of the Hitler youth throwing the, yeah. the books into the fire. Many of those books were books from uh, from uh, Hirsch, from Magnus Hirschfeld's uh, inst Institute uh, for Sexual Studies. Is that the English name for it? Which was uh, the only at that time uh, like trans research school. Um, they had made so much progress. There were people in Germany. There were trans people in Germany transitioning and receiving HRT, as far as we can tell, at that time. And wow. the and the, the school was burnt to the ground. Everything was burnt. And Magnus Hirschfeld had to flee Germany. Um, and he, he was Jewish. Um, and like there was like – and we lost – we lost a half of a century of history. We don't even know. Like, the, the HRT didn't even properly pick back up until almost the 70s. So there's like 50 years of lost science and lost history of trans people directly, t like, directly caused by the same things that led to the, the loss of, of Jewish history. And it, it's it's so fucked. It's just so fucked. And, and uh, I always recommend people to go take a look at the the documentary paris is burning because mm. uh paris is burning is a look into a world that most people never saw the 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 world of of queer people in in the 90s and the 80s um that nobody ever saw because they just didn't know it existed and a lot of those people uh, like it, it it fucking broke my heart because i got to the end of the video the end of the movie and i looked it up on wikipedia and almost every single person in that movie is dead and the movie yeah. was shot in the nineties, and I'm just like, what the what the fuck? Like all of these people who were in this movie are gone. You can't even get their stories anymore. They're gone. They're dead. And it's just like, okay, like, yeah, the magnitude hits you, you know, and and it's shocking. It's why recording yeah. history is so so insanely important, right? Yeah. And it's like I right now, like the work that I'm doing is I'm trying to do research on war crimes that happened to the Palestinians in the 1948 war. And luckily a lot of them are still alive, but they're not yeah. going to be alive for long. Yeah. Um, and there are just like, I don't know. I, I I'm obviously biased um, as this as someone who's, you know, dedicated my life to history, but yeah. I just think like maybe a lot of the answer to the issues that we've talked about is teaching people those stories, right? At least because, you know, we've lost a lot of them, but as yeah. you mentioned, there are some that we do know. And I wonder if teaching people that stuff and teaching people about like the history associated with that, because I didn't even know that, yeah. um, what you just mentioned about, um, uh, about like those, uh, that, that center that got destroyed. So yeah, it's super, if you look up, yeah. if you look up, um, a Magnus Hirschfield on Wikipedia, it's a hell of a rabbit hole to go down, but yeah, it was, um, it was like, uh, Again, there was in Germany there was uh there was solidarity between Jewish people and and queer people and again it's I don't think it's like an it's like a, a coincidence that the first person to meaningfully and humanely and lovingly compassionately seek to try to help trans people live a better life was a was a Jewish man in Germany you know what I mean like mm -hmm. there's that's that's not an accident of history there's there's an understanding of what of what that sort of alienation from society uh can do and can cause it it's just it's wild and um it is something that i bring up frequently on my stream because a lot of people don't know about it i didn't i mean i remember when i learned about that and i was like the, no i've never even learned i've seen the i've seen the photo and i never even knew what books you know were what? being burned this makes me want to do right because I hadn't even thought about it from that perspective, and I, I of all people should have. Um, and this makes me want to do like a seminar on like trans history in CC. Yeah. That would be That'd super be cool. I don't know, like if I could find. I don't know. Are there trans historians? I don't have that in my department. Um, but yeah, there <laughs> there are for sure. Um, offhand, I I probably I can't think of any like right offhand, but I could probably get you a list. I can think of a whole bunch yeah, of people who would be super would, cool. Yeah, if I don't, if I can't immediately recommend you people directly to contact, I can probably reach out to somebody, um, a couple of people who would know people. I know, like, right away off of hand, offhand, uh, there's a really famous trans author who wrote, uh, "She's not here," 
and it's a really famous like one of the one of the mm-hmm. first books that got really popular yeah i know uh, that one yeah jennifer finney boylan um mm-hmm. and jennifer finney boylan has been like is super super well connected um in in academia and could probably find all of those queer historians who have that stuff so and and uh, as i understand she's she's very very willing to respond to emails and stuff um she actually i i actually got to watch a fucking uh, like my I, it was a it was an online class at the time but the school that i went to she did a seminar there which i got to see which was so fucking cool um but that's just a little bit of a side story yeah i think <laughs> you're um, nerding out though like on your face like you like lit up yeah it was super great it was interestingly that that course that i took which was a um sex and sexuality um course that i took for a liberal arts fulfillment um it was amazing and not only that but it was like super super uh affirming to 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 find out that like oh wait a second like there i like there is a history of trans people like uh, mm-hmm. i i was locked away from that and i didn't know that but we've been here and we've been fighting and we've been pushing and there's been all this shit that i can dig into and um yeah there's a lot of stuff i mean uh, it's so-, so special like it is i well we've talked i guess for like hours now like about yeah. how fun debating is yeah. um but like i still think that the best medium in general for communicating is storytelling yeah I agree. like there's just um yeah just hearing people's stories i don't know um a lot of people um always like they always say like oh like everyone knows about the holocaust right when it mm-hmm. comes to uh, genocide education but it wasn't always the case it's yep. something that really started to be in people's minds around the 70s with like the beginnings of holocaust like movies and cinema yeah. and stuff and and books um as survivors started to feel more comfortable talking about what they experienced and like and now it's something that people are very educated about i mean not not as much as I'd like, but yeah, of uh, still more so than other genocides. And I think that, yeah. yeah, I just, I wish we would get better at telling people stories. Everyone's so focused on diversity of visually of actors and that's super important, but I want to see diversity in stories. Yeah. Like that's to me, like that is just so, so important. Yeah. And, and I do think that there's something like, I, I love I love history and I stress people to learn history to the best of their ability. And one of the things that I talk about on my channel a lot is history. And I also, I have, that's super cool. I have a, a, a series that has one episode in it right now called history mama, um, which is a, was heavily inspired by uh, Dan, Dan Carlin's hardcore history. Um, if you've ever heard of that, uh, it's yeah. an amazing podcast. Uh, that's that's like it's it's history storytelling. You know, like he always mm-hmm. says, you know, I'm not a professional historian, but I do a lot of reading, and I'm trying to tell the cool stories so that people get excited and go read about it more about themselves. And mm-hmm. I want to do more of that. Unfortunately, with history, it takes a lot of research, so I'm I'm behind. But I have <laughs> a couple of History Mama episodes that I've been slowly chipping away at, and then I'm gonna fucking drop them. I'm gonna have a whole playlist of these History Mama. The first one I did was um, the Battle of Blair Mountain, which was surprisingly one of my most successful videos uh like people love the shit and so like i want to i do want to get better at at history at at telling history in a way that's really exciting to people um because i think people get the idea that history is like super boring and like lists of uh this many people went dates to and this words place. Yeah, dates and words but but there's there's so much humanity to be gained from understanding history and when you don't know about history it's like it it's you're you're disoriented you you can't see things mm-hmm. that other people can see like there are there are things like i mean for example one one just very obvious example that i can bring bring off the top of my head uh donald trump at cpac just just what a month or two ago uh repeated the line america first america first america first over and over and over again literally Amer- had america first in in capital letters this is capital a america first america first was the slogan used by american nazis and nobody knows that mm-hmm. because it's not taught about you know and it's just like this is the thing you know a little you know a piece of history you recognize that you don't know history you don't recognize them doing the thing that they already did once before and it's just like mm-hmm. so it's so important it's so important to not be uh to 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 not be dissociated from your from the history of the world and the history of other humans in that way 
So yeah, I also I hate I hate how we teach Holocaust history, particularly history about Nazis, and it focuses so much on vilifying Nazis, right, themselves rather than their ideas, um, yeah. as if they were like these pure like I, evil devil people. Yeah. Um. So it, so like and we do it as a way to separate it from ourselves right as a way to say like oh we could never fall into those traps yeah. that's just like this one off situation um where they could be doing this and that's and you know and that's why you're in a situation where like there are situations where i want to make comparisons to hitler yeah. and everyone's just immediately like oh like oh, i don't know if it's that far and i'm like but i don't know i feel like there's a legitimate comparison um but yeah like when you treat them like they're these like you know non humans um you don't realize that like we can fall into those exact same patterns. And I yeah. feel like we kind of are, um, I like, I feel like we kind of have seen a lot of those patterns, especially in the last 10 years. Yeah. Um, and, but if I ever talk about that, like people are just think I'm completely insane. You want to know what's a, what was a fucking wild trip for me. That's like similar on this. Uh, people have found this before. Uh, it's somewhere on my discord, uh, back in 2016 on the night of the election, uh, Hillary versus Trump. Um, I called into, you know, are you familiar with David Pakman? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I called into David Pakman's show and uh, somebody found the clip and was like, I found you. I'm like, yeah, I told you. But I called in that night and I got in to talk about trans issues in America and how I was personally very upset by the, what I believed that, that Donald Trump would be really horrible for trans for trans issues. And I said, you know, I think, and I told David Pakman, I was like, you know, I, 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 I feel like a lot of people don't talk about this, but this isn't good. Like he's, he's made these motions of like, Oh, I like LGBT people. And yet everything that he proposes, all of his positions would be horrible for us. And sure mm -hmm. a fucking enough. Now looking back, all the way back to 2016 and hearing myself in my own voice l talking about these things that then became pivotal fucking issues over the last four years it was very was very uh what's the word it was very validating is the word i'm looking mm -hmm. for because uh there's a lot of people who will tell you that you're being hysterical that you're being um that you look that you're you're being ah you're being dramatic uh, you know saying that there's there's you know that Donald Trump is leaning on fascist rhetoric that that there's there's Nazi elements in his party and when you but if you have the facts to back it up then you, you can take some confidence in it and I don't think that people were really wrong I don't think anybody was really wrong like to call him a a strong man fascist who who p powered into into office largely by exploiting people's disgust and hate towards other people like I mean, there's no like his 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 language towards immigrants, his language towards. And of course, he kept the, the LGBT stuff on a real down low early on. But we know he ended up banning all trans people from the military. He ended up issuing mm -hmm. a a a uh, memo via the Department of uh, Human Services, Health and Human Services that um, told uh, people how to spot trans people and. And it is so bad. It is, it's just horrible. It's like look for an Adam's apple and and facial hair. And it's like, okay, first of all, you're going to get a lot of false positives there, which is like, you know, that's a practical problem. You're going to get a lot of people like you know, women like like cis women have problems with fucking facial hair too. You know, like mm -hmm. it's not just. But also the fact that like this was a government issued memo on how to spot so you, trans people so you can kick them so you can discriminate against them is like a level like that is so fucked and people didn't even know about it people don't even know about it it's just oh god it's so bad and yeah i i, I well, wish we need to be able to make those comparisons right yeah. um yeah. and it doesn't and just because you compare something doesn't mean you're equating it yeah um or saying that it's at the same dangerous kind of level um, that we need to focus much more. And this is why I just, I wish I'll repeat again. I just wish we, that we taught, um, world war II and Nazi history differently. And we focused much more on vilifying the ideas, um, and the dangerous ideas associated with it rather than the people behind it. Um, not to say that those people didn't do horrible things they did, but, uh, the truth is, is that anyone 
and everyone in the right circumstances can be susceptible to those ideas um, if you don't if you're not aware of how of how they come up yeah and how, how did you yeah, feel by the I'm, way just out of curiosity how did you feel about the movie jojo rabbit if you've i didn't seen see it. it oh my god okay you should see it personally i thought it was really good at doing exactly what you're talking about um what, uh, and... what was it about so Jojo Rabbit is about a a kid who is in the Hitler Youth, um, and he uh, he finds out that uh, there is a Jewish stowaway in his house, and mm. this kid is so into the, uh, the 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 ideology that he his imaginary friend is literally Hitler, and. Um, so there's, it's a very funny, it's a very darkly funny movie, but, um, and it was made, uh, the, the, it was made by, uh, a Taika Waititi who I love. Um, and he also plays Hitler in the movie. So he, the, 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 the imaginary friend Hitler is like, like, it's like hilariously goofy because it's like a child's imagination of what, like he thinks like Hitler would be based on what he's been taught in these things. But I, I thought it really succeeded on two levels. It did a very good job of, of of talking about the ideas versus like saying like, Oh, all Nazis were like these individual, they were like orcs that are just automatically evil mm -hmm. from birth. Um, but it also did a really good job at portraying um, indoctrination, which I talked about earlier on um, in the stream that I think is really super important um, to bring up. And, and it's uh it does that really well because this kid is like super gung ho. He's like super gung ho. And in fact, like he's more gung ho than like his teachers. And it's like this, there's this whole aspect of like this kid, uh, being really into like this ideology that's been foisted on him by the circumstances. And then only to like, I, I don't want to spoil anything because a lot of stuff happens in the movie, but he has this, th there's this whole like slow and sure inversion of like what he views and how he totally changes and sees the world differently as a result of getting out and away from the indoctrination that he was being put into. And it also points out that like this, this kid is a good, is obviously a good, per, like a, a good person at heart, but all he's ever known is the messaging of the Nazi party because that's all that was given to him. So that's all he has mm -hmm. to operate on. And it's We're like products of our environment. Yeah. And, and yeah. uh, I do agree that like, obviously like, um, there, like the scary thing, I think that a lot of people, and part of the reason maybe why it doesn't get taught this way is, you know, it's easier to have like a black and white, good guy, bad guy type situation. But the thing that's scary, um, is that the, the Germany is a, was a massive country and it took a lot of people to enact world war two and the Holocaust a lot of people and mm -hmm. all and all of those people were not born evil all of those people were not born like uh you know anti-semitic all of those people were the subjects of a society that that set up these pathways and to varying degrees often many many times very um coercive but these structures guide the way that people's lives go and for a you know, some people may get out of it. Some people through chance circumstance or moral, uh, um, uh, you know, a moral awakening or whatever, uh, they might find out, but a lot of people are just going to find themselves pushed along with the rest of their society. And that's scary because it makes us think that, oh, like, are there these things in our society that could be doing that right now? And I would say, mm -hmm. yes, you know, there are structures in our society that, um, that push people, down bad paths i mean there's so many everything from you know the, the 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 structural racism that has been around you know forever in this country since since this country was founded but but to uh even to the way that like things are talked about in media to uh the types of stories that get they get pushed and you know thankfully we're not at the point where we don't have it we don't have an autocrat we don't have a single furor who can uh dictate down but there are people who want to push for that and you know learning learning history learning that that people people being the indoctrination is terrifying can do so much damage can perhaps make sure that we never get to that point and that's what i hope for um in most of my yeah you know stuff this, that i work um... on Sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. Um, 
Mo- uh, yeah, this just reminds me, like, if and if you look at if you look at Nazis in that new lens, mm-hmm. you start realizing how much of these patterns are everywhere around you, even patterns that you've fallen into yourself, right? Yeah. Which is probably the most important. Um, the I know, like. I, I, and I'm not creating a false equivalency between left and right, but even like there are situations of things where I do see like on the left where I do see them fall into mm-hmm. those same patterns um, yeah. and where I've seen myself fall into those same patterns, especially with vilification. Um, the um, with on YouTube and the way we prop up these people as like, you know, everyone has like their favorite content creator and they worship them. Mm -hmm. Um, Like that, that attitude, I I call it like great man syndrome, but it it obviously can apply to women um, and anyone in between, but um, like that kind of stuff, it starts making you just way more aware um, of yourself of falling into those same traps. The biggest one I, I would say is like those greater good arguments because ultimately, and a lot of people don't know this, that, um, uh, Himmler, the uh, the person who orchestrated the final solution of the Holocaust, mm-hmm. um, he knew what he was doing was wrong. Um, right. It's part of what makes what he did so so terrible. He, he we can you can go and look at his speech of yeah. when he gave it to um, to his fellow officers, where he said, "I it breaks my heart what we have to do, but we have to do it for the greater good of the Germans." Yeah. And like and that and that idea of, of you know, breaking morality for this so-called greater good kind of idea is something that you can apply to, you can see a lot of people using yeah. in their everyday life. It's, and so and it makes, dangerous. yeah, it makes me very aware of it. Yeah. It's the, it's the sort of Machiavellianism. And uh, mm-hmm. I, th- I think it's a, it is a very difficult thing to think about because um, like there's always a question of like how, how how far is is too far and where is that line and that's a fucking yep. crazy crazy hard question you know what i mean when you, especially when you're talking about politics when you're talking about like i mean of course like we all know like the on the left the, the stereotype between the like super revolutionary types and the non-revolutionary types and that is but i see that there's legitimacy in that conversation because it's like well it is really fucked how our society right now uh totally seems to be totally fine with the fact that we're running concentration camps of a type on the border um and and yeah they might not be like they they might not be death camps but they're really fucking bad and we kind of some of us are mad about it but a lot of us are just kind of like you know it's part of the there's a lot of americans who are just kind of like it's part of our you know we have to do it to make sure the border doesn't explode or something and it's kind of like Mm -hmm. okay so these things get really murky and uh and and then i think there is another problem which is that i think that even on the left there is a lack of um structural analysis uh for lack of a better term of that that like a lot of times the reason why like this Machiavellianism is is able to get out of control is because so much power is given to so few um, that like when you have a situation where very you know, true yeah like you you have a situation where like a like a like Hitler has supreme power and then he divvies that power on a on, you know very very st- like stingily to a number of people those people suddenly have so much power that their conclusion even if it's totally raw even if it's totally ridiculous like we ha- we must do this for the good of germany well he was wrong like really wrong obviously and it's like but he was given this power to make that mistake and nobody could tell him no and when you have power that isn't distributed there's no checks there's th- that that is it's so problematic and i really wish that like one thing i really hope that uh, you know, I and I talk about this a lot on my show, but something that I hope to teach, you know, to, to impress on people and show people is that, like, you have to be very careful with how you deal with power because power can go to your head really quick, but not just that. It can, uh, like, even the best, the best leader you can possibly imagine is never going to be perfect. And and their mm-hmm. their flaws are going to be magnified by however much power they wield. Imagine if, like, the, the greatest that leader... That is so true. Yeah, like right, like ima- the greatest like humans are kind of like a uh, a conduit. You put a ton of power through a human, it's gonna 
come out in some maybe some really good ways through their strengths, but their bad way their weaknesses are also going to be magnified. And so, yes, do I believe that individuals can do a really good job at like strengthening their strengths and 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 improving their weaknesses so they don't have as like as many character flaws or whatever? I do believe that, obviously. Of course humans can do that. But we also have to recognize that even small character flaws when when given incredible power can do a lot of damage. So it it's really in my mind, very, very important that we learn, that we recognize that like- we have checks and balances. Yeah, checks and balances. And uh, like outside of the, the American meme, because you know I think our checks and balances are not that great, but um, but like, you know, people think of the constitution or whatever. And I think there's a lot of flaws with that, but, the, but truly real checks and balances are super, super, super important. Um, and uh, it becomes increasingly important the more uh, impactful a position is, you know, like- um, uh, it, it's, well, it's it, one of the reasons why debating is so good, right? Because we're yeah. almost always putting each other in checks and checks and balances, just like with our own opinions, um, even if we don't have that much power, but especially for those who have um, audiences, right? And yeah. um, and large platforms, there is power that comes with that. Yep. So there is, yeah. yeah, I do think that's cool. And the, we have a lot of like issues online about, I, I think there's really fucked up incentive structures on in streaming um that nobody can really do anything about right now or not much mm -hmm. about because we're all contractors that are subsidiaries of one everyone's of trying two to earn companies. a living yeah so yeah. There, these things exist but i still think that we can do better than just letting it be you know what i mean we can do better than than replicating the problems of the past i think we can do better at providing checks and not creating super cults of personality and and networking and, and making sure there's multiple voices yeah so yeah that's why i'm so happy that you and i've gotten to talk today you yeah, know yeah it's been like wonderful. i feel like i got this to know you great... so much more <laughs> yeah. and 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 now i'm even more excited to debate you because i just i don't know because yeah. now I know so much more about where you get your ideas from. And I feel like that'll also allow me to be more charitable. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and and also maybe you'll kick my ass and, and find out one of my weak spots. And, <laughs> I don't know about that, I'll but I'll, I'll certainly try. Yeah, well, hey, listen, I, I always like it, – it's always a nice feeling to get uh, surprisingly owned. Um, it doesn't, doesn't I know. happen very Especially much. Especially when but, you're uh... – it's a good feeling. Yeah, it honest. is. It is. It's a good feeling to go, oh, shit, I hadn't even identified that, that weak spot – Good thing it happened in this sparring session with somebody who's not going to kill me. Now I can learn to shore up that defense so I don't get owned when I go up against yep. a, a Nazi or something, you know? Yeah. One last question. I noticed Absolutely. that there is a guitar in your background. Yeah. And I'm a huge guitar nerd. So do you, do you play guitar? I'm guessing I, you I, do. I am, I am learning to play guitar, yeah. I played a little bit of guitar. Uh, okay, so when I was younger, I played a lot of piano. And then I started to learn guitar. And then I, a bunch of life stuff happened and I haven't touched a guitar in forever, but I got the urge really bad lately because uh, I don't have my piano anymore for another random life reason, um, which sucks. But I really wanted to play music. And so I got this, I spent a bunch of time thinking about it and I eventually settled on this Ibanez 12 string and I've been loving Amazing. it. Amazing. Um, I'm super bad right now, um, but... Uh, you are ambitious for a 12 string though i well, can never try I, I, that the thing is i love to i'm i i thought about it a lot but i was like like i love this i love the sound i love the sound so much so i figure uh go with the 12 string learn it uh get it get it all you know uh get used to holding down the strings and then if i want to get a six string at some point hey i've already i'll be going down from the, the 12 to the yeah, six yeah no it's be way a easier yeah it's the same thing like when you learn on an acoustic versus going to electric because it's so much easier i'm gonna get so much hate for this this might get me canceled but it is so much easier to play the electric than playing the classical so that's why you're always no, supposed to learn on it an acoustic is. right yep no I, I was told the same thing when i when i because i did take guitar lessons for a while when i was a lot younger and uh my guitar teacher was like get, we, we're gonna get you started on an acoustic and then you could switch to the electric later because it is it is it's much more it's physically easier like the skill the mm -hmm. basic skill set like learning the chords all that just as hard mentally very challenging but physically uh you don't have to you don't have to be as clean with your with your chords you don't have to be as uh as consistent with like how you're holding down the strings um, and the, the fact that like, um, 
you can do like all kinds of tricky stuff that with the electric because the pickup is so high that like you mm. can just barely touch a string and it'll get you a, a note that sounds fine but on a on an acoustic if you're going to be playing without an amp uh you're not gonna you're you're gonna get a really muted sound if you don't know what you're doing with the string so yeah that was my experience and and yeah i recognize it's gonna be a little harder but uh at the same time i'm very excited and i have been uh for the record chat i have been practicing and jessica metal i have been practicing the video that you sent me don't you worry i have been don't you worry <laughs> so, you know yeah. at some point because i've noticed that a lot of like twitch youtube debaters are musicians mm. and i don't know like what's the reason for that like weird combination yeah. um but you know maybe we should all just start a big band that would be fucking yeah. awesome i've like i have like <laughs> jam sessions that i, I want to do so bad with people in the future um once i get there like if i was if it was p with piano like uh like I, I'm already like I, I can already improvise and play. I'm very confident in piano, but uh, I've got a long way to go in guitar. But on this, at the same time, I'm very excited. See, I'm the opposite. It. Yeah, learning piano, but pretty good at guitar. Piano is uh, challenging, um, but it's super rewarding. Uh, the thing that annoys me about piano is that like it's such a, uh, it's such an it's such an inaccessible instrument. Like it again, is. It's so. Yep. I I know it takes how up so to play. Space. Yeah, it takes and up they're space expensive. and they're expensive. Oh my god. Now, that said, the experience of playing on a on a Steinway Grand or other masterwork piano instrument uh mm -hmm. is like nothing else. It is a divine it is a, a divine experience. Um and I, I wish that every person who ever gets learns to play keyboard or piano gets the experience of getting to play on an instrument like a Steinway because it is a a masterwork every single one of them is a masterpiece it is this unbelievably complex machine that has a richness of sound that can hardly even be imagined unless you've sat in front of one and played it um but oh, uh, my chat just thought of the name for the band uh called the debate bros the debate bros yeah it's perfect <laughs> i love it i love it and uh, we'll have a the, the leading song will be debate me debate me debate me yeah <laughs> it'll be perfect incredible um, yeah i think it's fantastic but yeah uh, honestly thank you so much for this chat it was thank super you. cool like i'm just getting into streaming so it was really nice well you're for, a fantastic um, interviewer like fantastic oh my God, thank, you. Yeah. thank you that means a lot that means a lot yeah uh i, I was mean, actually super nervous right i was because yeah. you're very good with rhetoric so it's like oh what do you think i was, I was little... gonna spin you around in circles no nah, i'm not like i don't know like <laughs> um the yeah you never know with like if you're gonna jive with someone with these yeah. interviews or not um and yeah i feel like we did and that was super super cool so yeah well thank you so I, much, I like, really love this and uh i am super happy to talk with you anytime you want to talk just let me know and I'm, I'm totally down to work on stuff with you um yeah so uh thank you so much and and by the way chat uh go follow aristocracy tv on twitch please oh, because thank you. if you like this type of stuff Eris is streaming this type of stuff so there you go yeah so thank you so much and uh let's let's talk soon let's keep in touch okay yeah we're friends on discord now so yeah and um, i'm in your discord so you now, which discord. i didn't know which i didn't know about i knew about calliopean club which i think i ha i'm in right yeah now, this but... one we're not sure if we're keeping this one we might be combining it with cc but okay. um well yeah so I'll, yeah. I'll let you know either way well thank you so and much we and we uh, cc for the seminar idea. I think yeah, that would be really that would be super talk cool. Talk about dance history. Absolutely. Uh thank you so much, Aris. Yeah. Bye for now. See ya. <laughs> that was pog as fuck. Wasn't that a pog ass conversation? I told you all that was gonna be a fucking pog ass conversation. That was good as fuck, wasn't it?